Hello everyone! Welcome back to the RationalVista.com's Broiler Chicken Show! Let's see if uh, YouTube's doing its thing. RationalVista.com's Awesome. Uh, so, welcome back to the Frivolity. My apologies, of course, to the uh, probably the public and YouTube people. I see there's a good uh, 20, 30 of you over there, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but, um, you know, especially the first uh, few weeks of the uh, new school term, uh, getting through just a mountain of learning material with the level oneers, um, uh, doesn't surprise me. Uh, Grim was uh, rather busy today uh, with the level oneers. I was in there helping out. And um, eh, eh, kind of a fun adventure. Uh, you never know what the hell's going to happen with these uh, internetings. And um, I was able to pop in and provide a nice little sideshow. I uh, did some sword swallowing. I, uh, I think I read somebody's horoscope, did a tarot card reading, and then, uh, then the main event was able to continue. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I think the level winners felt pretty good. Uh, I don't know. Give me some feedback. Uh, I hope you guys felt, uh, well supported there. And, uh, you know, sometimes technology, uh, does throw you a curveball. Uh, but I think we handled it pretty well there. And, uh, Grim didn't get too stressed out while, uh, the computer, uh, um, hey, Michelle says 100% supported. I like to hear that. That's good. Um, you guys are all fucking crazy ass bullish on silver now. I find it so funny. You guys kill me. <laughs> uh, just trade your setups. You know, if the market's going to run, great. Make sure you're in proxies and take advantage. Uh, I found it fascinating how everybody, and it, you know, if anything, this scares the hell out of me. Because now this is like circle jerk. We're just we're jumping from one circle jerk to the next, and you got these uh, little tech uh, forum guys that are just basically pulling people's strings here. Uh, you know, uh, even in the level one program, you know, it's uh, part of the uh, the session this morning is Q and A, and just a bunch of people are like. Oh, how do you think GameStop's going to go here? What do you think's going to happen with these Wall Street bets and all that? Um, I mean, I can weigh in on it, but, uh, you know, the sad thing is, is I'm the guy, uh, if you're going to ask me questions, you probably already know the answer that I'm going to give you. It's just going to be the boring con curmudgeon um, you know, uh, well, you know, don't chase. You should have been buying when nobody else was interested. And now that all the public is going stupid ape shit, you should be selling into their euphoria. But, uh, boring. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> That's not YOLO, you FOMO. <laughs> so... You know, people try to get me to, to to say, hey, Brian, is it okay to uh, even dollar cost average into Bitcoin here at uh, $35,000 a coin? And I got to say, from time-tested playing this game 30 years, the answer, for, unfortunately, for a guy like, like me is no. Which sucks. I mean, you don't want to hear that. I know you don't want to hear that. But, you know, at least... Uh, if it's one thing I'm absolutely true of is I am not going to blow smoke up your ass. If I And if I'm super jazzed about something and I'm bullish, and it's because I own it and I'm expecting to make money on my investment. I don't care whether you buy or sell anything that I talk about. Don't give a rat's ass. But what I would, like I said, what I will do is I will give you my honest... Uh, um, opinion, for lack of a better word. And uh, if that opinion doesn't agree with you, okay. I mean, that's what makes a market, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I noticed uh, some of the uh, younger kids uh, this morning getting all excited about silver. 
You know, ironically enough, I suppose uh, the time to buy silver was when a good old dab there was super excited about silver years ago. Don't know whether it makes sense uh, chasing it here, but oh well. You do with your money as you please. I'll do with uh, my money as I please. Um, like I said there a few minutes ago, the purpose of these uh, Sunday shows is really to talk to the level one audience and just make sure that uh, if there are any lingering questions, and of course we did fundamental analysis week, so uh, uh, I would imagine there's going to be a bunch of sort of unfinished questions there. So uh, Kevin or Sharky, if you either of you are on the uh, call, uh, do you happen to have the level oneers? Um, um, Q&A document uh, handy just so I can work off of that. Um, I, you know, uh, since everybody's all jazzed about silver right now, I suppose we can talk about it. One good thing actually I do like about the silver gold trade right now, and this is almost kind of like, um, you know, bigger picture macroeconomics. Uh, what is the market uh, message? Um... One thing that I did like about this silver market, and I've been talking to you guys about this on uh, public broadcast recently, is uh, I'm very curious to watch the gold-silver ratio and what it sort of tells us about the economy and sort of what investor temperament is. Also, too, this should be a reiteration of this idea of that uh, fear-greed cycle transition. So if anything, what I, I, I like what I'm seeing here. You know, at the end of the fear cycle, there should be a predominant preference for physical assets over paper assets. So to a certain degree, gold's not really used as an industrial product. Um, so, whereas silver is more so, hell, I think they're even putting silver in, like, clothing nowadays. Um, <clears throat> so, if consumer demand is strong and uh, the economy is chugging along, you should see this relationship move downward. So, it's interesting, you know, my level oneers, you know, this is my whole thesis of us transitioning out of the uh, generation, um, the baby boomer generation's uh, respective fear cycle, leaving the economy and moving into uh, the next generation's greed cycle, the millennials, and them entering and taking over the economy. Interestingly enough, actually, this is a pretty good uh, anecdote of that. So. You know, I, I could see all you guys are all like, oh, oh silver, 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 I'm going to get silver, silver. So uh, all I really care, uh, I mean, you know, for whatever it's worth, I suppose let's let's all fucking get our circle jerk on. Um, I picked up a bit of this silver stock. Uh, it, was a, um, it was a cute, I mean, remember, I trade setups, right? So... This is very normal A, B, C, D. Uh, this is a log chart, so it probably looks a little skewed there. A, B, C, D continuation pattern. So I'm getting the impression from all your excitement that silver is probably going to pop out tomorrow morning. And I'm probably going to be actually exiting this trade tomorrow morning. <laughs> and to all of your guys' euphoria. You guys are chomping on the bit. Want to buy, want to buy, want to buy. This thing gaps higher here tomorrow morning. I'm going to be on the sell side, ringing the register. So <laughs> that's uh, I do find that a bit amusing. Uh, we'll see what happens. But in essence, my trading plan says that uh, uh, I have to uh, start ringing the register here at uh, 26 and a half on this thing. So just FYI, you know. Ah, interesting how that's basically just they're going to pop the old highs on this thing. So, uh, you know, that would be like called like fading the rally kind of idea. So eh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that you guys are also uh, all bullish and you want to buy. Uh, and I'm actually going to be thinking of probably I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if you see a tweet out from me tomorrow morning saying I'm ringing the register and taking profits. So anyway, like I said earlier, the big message for me is this is actually really important to me. This is like structural. And that's good 
because I mean this relationship has been going in gold's favor for a very very long time so it's about time that this damn thing finally uh, unwinds and if anything I like this thinking like I said earlier that this is more a lack of confidence in the system the system's broken the system's failing the system's crumbling the system's collapsing and this ironically enough is actually well actually things aren't so bad and actually the economy is doing okay industrial demand for silver uh, actually using this stuff not just sitting there buried with your head buried in the sand oh, the sky's falling that that's actually a good sign in my my opinion but you know that's the weird thing about this um, current market state and it's you know this is gonna be really difficult I mean super difficult because uh, you know I don't know how long you have been in the market as a quote-unquote investor but basically for the past 20 years uh, we have been in a one very particular market state uh, and things are about to change dramatically folks um, and you know the worst part about it is that at this particular part of the market state telling people to actually go in and invest in hard assets like commodities like gold and oil you couldn't do it <laughs> You literally couldn't give away gold through this. In fact, there was a really juicy scandal in the gold market, which made it even harder. You literally couldn't. Oh, no, no, don't want to touch that. It's all scam. It's all scam. And, of course, that was the trade, right? It was to step in and buy your crude and buy your gold and shit through here. So, I don't know, man. Uh, me, personally, I'm... I'm um, I'm, um, interestingly enough, I'm actually, you know, you look outside and you're like, oh my God, is it COVID, sky's falling. <laughs> I'd actually be now, if you, and the good part about it is I do. <laughs> I've got this beautiful programmer who's built this just absolutely incredible engine that literally, this will let us take over the world. <laughs> I don't need to do any more public work. I got a ton of capital sitting there just waiting to go. I can ex execute. I can invest in anything I want. Uh, and and this is the window. This is the window right here. This window will probably last maybe a year or so, maybe a couple of years, where you look out your window and everybody, uh, window, how ironic. But you look out your window and everybody's going to be like, it's horrible, it's a mess, it's a nightmare, rest, you know, buy gold, bury your head in the sand, it's all a scam, Federal Reserve's out to get you, right? And I would actually make the argument that that's, of course, exactly the 1%'s plan, because when shit really is a buy, they want you, the public, thinking the exact opposite. I mean, it's just perfect. You literally couldn't orchestrate this any better. It is just so perfect. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, so, where do you begin? Uh, you know, I would actually say if you, if you know how to trade and you can do things like hunt weekly W's and momentum divergences and, you know, force yourself to take profits at appropriate locations, man, oh, the goodness, this, this market is just a gift. The issue I think here, probably the biggest thing everybody has to be worried about here is you don't want to get sucked up into the noise. You know, the noise of the market right now is that game stock. I mean, that's pathetic. I mean, frankly speaking, none of us at TRI should even be the slightest bit interested in this thing. None of us. First and foremost, volatility's gone through the roof, so like options traders, totally off the table. Implied volatility premiums have gone through the roof. And it makes sense. <laughs> That's exactly what's supposed to happen. And then secondly, and this is the worst part about it, if you did want to participate in this, this is exactly the same thing as Bitcoin. I can show you exactly where we were supposed to buy it. I pitched the idea to my group and they were like, man, nah, nobody buys video games and retail stores anymore whatever uh, i don't even give a shit about the trade it's just another trade and it's cute it's a fun anecdote it's perfect right 
but who cares what it's doing here? You know, from us actually like market participants were professionals, this is a total non-issue for a guy like me. It's like, you know, this is the what the public is interested in. You know, very much, right? If we hit the rewind button and go back to when this thing actually was a buy. I don't know how I do that. Isn't that that button there? I thought it was that button. Nope. I screwed it up. Uh, <coughs> what have I got here? Maybe I have to refresh this or something. Oh, goodness. I mean... The, the point I'm trying to make to you is that when this thing was a buy, nobody in the public was even the slightest bit interested. Like I said, the public was basically saying, you know what, this, this, isn't, uh, this isn't even a, an idea I would even be interested in. And it makes sense, because frankly speaking, that's, you know, it sucks, but half of investing is actually forcing yourself to go in and buy when nobody else is interested in. But anyway, um, okay, so I just wanted to show you. Let's see if I can do this, but I don't know whether it worked or not. Okay, let's try that again. You know, and anybody who's at uh, TRI in the school and stuff like that, and you're like, okay, how does, you know, level one, you want to get uh, going on setups and stuff. This is the fastest way to learn, right? Is, uh, you know, if you were interested, and we were kicking around, the fundamentals weren't terrible at this point but this is the kind of thing you want to be seeing and of course this is a log chart so if we change that back to a regular chart right gee whiz have you ever heard brian use uh, that expression uh, reload zones before so something like there to there and this is kind of why the stock appealed to me it dipped into the reload zone here eh? and the reason why i didn't pull the trigger on that was because that high was just outside the reload zone. Hey, eh? what a cocksucker. But anyway, what it coulda, should us. So point here is that when we get down into this area, and of course you start looking at your indicators and they start flashing, hey, Willie is stupidly oversold and look at this MACD momentum divergence, right? So, you know, maybe you're like, okay, well, there's a reload zone, this kind of an interesting area, right? And then, right? You want to wait for the W, still no W. Oh, that's looking interesting. That's looking interesting. And hello, there it is. So W comes in. Do you see the W in OBV on rising volume? Does anybody see this? Anyone? Am I just talking to myself here? <laughs> this is supposed to be a two-way conversation here, people. Thank you. Good. I got a couple people in the hangout here with me. How about you people over on YouTube? I mean, seriously, are you here to learn how to trade? I mean, you shouldn't be the slice bit interested in this uh, game stock at three, four hundred dollars, and the story's over. It's yesterday's story. That is what you have to be concentrating on. If you wanted to buy game stock, I can tell you the exact day it happened. Right there. Bang in your face it's just it who do you think would have been interested in trading this here the answer is no one <laughs> so there's your buy i mean it's as plain as day Wait, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see if uh, if uh, the YouTube audience knows the answer to this. What, do we have a setup where if you see W's in uh, Willy or W's in RSI and W's in OBV and W's in price, what what do we call that? Call it a pretty fucking good setup is what I'd call it. <laughs> and you tell me, if you had bought this thing at four and change there, would you be a happy camper here today? <laughs> no, it's not El Tango, uh, but it's close, you know, I mean, it's similar. <laughs> Actually, I'm surprised more people on the... Uh, YouTube page. And where is that Davo guy? The guy's gotten so big now, he doesn't even pay attention to us little people. I told all of you guys and all you students, right? Same thing. 
You know, my job's to make you famous, but then if you get really big and famous, you got to come back and hang with the peeps every once in a while. Don't forget us. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to know when to buy game stock, I think the moment was right there. And, you know, I mean, just for fun, you know, how would Brian have approached this? Well, you can see that level looks like it's about four and change. So that means that, okay, if we get a rally up into $8 area, then Brian's probably going to be selling half on a double just to get your original capital back in your pockets and just get yourself a risk-free trade. All right, there's a nice pop-up to 6.7. Do I do anything right now? No. Hey, there we go. All right, well, we got a pop to 7. Am I at my double level yet? What did we hit there? What was that high? That high is uh, 715. Still don't do anything. Hey, there we go. Whoops. Oh, okay. Close. Hey, there's my double level. Wait, so what an interesting coincidence. There's the double level, 845, right? We said that the uh, buy there was at uh, 431. So 432, so 860, 864. So we still don't have our fill yet. Do we do anything here? I don't think so. Just let it work. Come on, baby. Come on. Oh, no. I got it. I'm going to get destroyed. Do I do anything? No. Nope. Hey, hello. Bingo. There we go. So we got our fill. Now we're sitting on a risk-free trade. Do I give a shit what happens to the rest of this from here on out? Uh, yeah, I mean, the cool part about it is once you're at this stage, you got your original money back in your hands. And probably the absolute best thing here is you just can't get hurt. This is the best way to play capitalism. You know, get you, sell half on a double, get your original money back, and then whatever happens in the market, what happens? And sometimes, folks... This is why we always say it's don't get into the habit or don't get into the business of predicting the future because you don't know what the fuck is going to happen in the future. Nobody does. I mean, it's just, you know, now at this point, well, hello. Yeah, well, that was a nice treat. I mean, would it be in your best interest to sell everything now? I mean, obviously we have the power of hindsight, so we know what the answer is, but you know, 865, where's my next sell level? You guys should all be able to tell me what I'm going to do next. Hmm? So, uh, 16, 17, 17 and a half bucks, somewhere in there. We got another sell order working. So, we'll just be patient and just see what happens. You know, the interesting thing is, like, we all know the end story here. And this is the trap of technical analysis. So looking at this chart, volume impetus is falling off. Momentum, even MACD momentum is like, holy massive divergence. Oh, crap. RSI's double topped out. Willie, um, you know, didn't really flash. Well, I guess we did get an overbought uh, reading there, but definitely not looking happy. This is actually where... I think the technical analysis community doesn't really do the public a lot of favors. Because people look at technical analysis as sort of like, uh, what was the, uh, you know, the exact bottom, the exact top. And I'm going to use technical analysis to tell me when to time my trades based on that. And that's dangerous. So remember, technical analysis is really... The best use of it is to help you identify edge and help you identify... Um, risk windows, if you will. So if you're already on a free position, you have no risk involved in ownership of this. Quite often, I will actually just tune technical analysis out and just simply say, you know what, this thing's going to do whatever it does. And I know that's like, he said, what? Because really, I don't mean to be rude, but technical analysis is not really going to help you much through this. It's clearly going to identify, 
you know, Willie being stupid, should we be a buyer in here? Fuck no. <laughs> this has got risk. Just insane amount of risk all over it. But helping us exit our trades on something like this, eh, it's not really going to help you a heck of a lot. What I would say, technical analysis would be in this kind of scenario, would be, okay, well, if I miss the trade back here and I wanted to try and join the trade, where should I be hunting? You know, reload zones, top of value, gaps filled in, original market structure. All right, well, if I wanted to participate, at least I know where is a half-decent area to start looking. Bing bong. Um, well, let's see what happened. I mean, you may not have even gotten the reload zone pullback here. You know, it's interesting at this point, you might have looked at this and said, well, you know, I could see trend continuation. So why don't I, um... I, I'm I, I'm gonna keep the bot uh, or excuse me uh, a reload zone and this would I would like consider like value level if I can get dips down into there you know Brian's a chicken ship by nature all that kind of crazy stuff um, yeah and actually you mentioned somebody mentioned we could probably do chaos levels off of this and that probably actually painted the targets up here but we won't go there today that's just too much. <laughs> But at this point, you might think, well, you know, maybe this is going to be a trend continuation. All right. So what's that? That's like bot. Okay, well, it did do 33%. We're no longer thinking value investing here, right? That was coming in off all this stuff. Now we're thinking like trend continuation, and I'd like to trade this thing. Remember I showed you that silver trade uh, that I'm in right now, and I'll probably get filled uh, tomorrow um on uh, the open as you know all you guys go ape shit into that so if i was thinking now well i've missed this i'll keep my eye open for the reload zone but if we start making like three higher highs or three higher lows and we start breaking down trend lines maybe i'm going to want to try and just trend continuation trade my way through this so that might be something like uh that so I can kind of see a W already starting to form here, right? And then if I do trend line analysis, you can see the break of the trend line. So now if I get any kind of W action here, I can start to think about, oh, okay, maybe I'm going to trade through this. Okay, let's see what happens. <clears throat> oh, hello, hello. Okay, one low, two lows. We got this big reversal low. I mean, it's a bit aggressive. I like three lows to work with. And actually, a level three or just went through the, the module yesterday on stop management. So let's see whether they come after this low again here. But you can start to see the smatterings of a bottom starting to form here. Oh, oh boy, here we go. Oh, oh boy, here we go. Okay, so at this point, again, you know, yeah, how, the, and this is really the maturation of you as a trader. Do you want to wait for those three lows to come in? Or you're like, fuck it, Brian, that's a W. And let's look at momentum. Momentum's pointing up. Remember we said W's in OBV. I see volume rising. I see W's in uh, uh, Willie. Look at all these W's in RSI. We do the three W uh, pattern on RSI. So she should be able to identify that this looks like this was actually a pretty big buy signal there, eh? Any of you guys follow along my funny little RSI uh, tutorial? I swear, I should probably like write a course on this kind of shit someday. Uh, but we can go like this. And really, I wasn't expecting to talk about GameStop today. I'm not even quite sure why we're doing this, but what the hell. Um, <clears throat> so there's your first W that sort of stops the bear. And I always like to paint that teal. Then the second W, we usually paint in yellow, and this is the buy or sell signal if the second W or M uh, comes in. And the key here is, is it through the 50 line? And notice, oh boy, that's 50, 53.3. Oh, that looks like one of those 50 line moves. So I think your buy signal came in right here. Uh, so what does that look like? Let's go see what the market did right on that date there. 
All right, so that's there, that's right there. Remember we said that's your double bottom. One low, two lows, three lows, four lows. Hey, that's actually a pretty good looking level. So what do you think, guys? Uh, people on YouTube, are you enjoying this? It's kind of fun. I'm walking you through this idiot trade that nobody in the public can understand, and yet it's actually pretty fucking cliche. <laughs> what do you think? Somebody tell me. Do you guys see this? This isn't really actually rocket science at all. <laughs> so anyway, point of the matter here is technically big ass buy signal right through here. Entry, move stop to scratch now. So we're approaching that. Hasn't hit that yet. Let's see what happens. Do boom. All right, so now we've hit uh, move stop to scratch. Now we've hit move stop to trailing. So at this point, you really shouldn't lose any money. Um, uh, is monthly W more powerful than weekly? You mentioned weekly and very often. How about monthly? Yeah, absolutely. The higher the time frame signal, Aditya, the more powerful the message. So monthly W's, insanely powerful. Quarterly W's, oh my God, wonderful. Yearly W's, oh, sex delicious. Decade W's, why not? Throw it on the pile. <laughs> sure. And actually, Aditya in our level two program, uh, we do an exercise called tricking out your charts, uh, which we go through the exercise of horizontal support and resistance and understanding the relative significance of different time frame uh, pivot levels on your charts and a lot of forex traders that I used to trade with actually not so much forex I think forex is a joke but uh, uh, the the currency futures traders uh, a lot of them would use those tricked out horizontal support and resistance charts um, and uh, and just kill the market. So to answer your question, yes. <laughs> okay, so back to our story. Uh, we're long game stock from uh, looks like about uh, what is that? Um, eh, well, let's say somewhere in here. Whatever the hell that number is, twelve ninety three, somewhere in that near neighborhood, somewhere off of that. Eh, maybe even off of this high here. That's a nice double bottom there. That's uh, 1266, so yeah, we'll split the difference. We'll say we're long from say 1275 or so. Eh, 1282, what the hell. Um, we should move our stop to scratch at this point. Now we've hit 66% uh, of the anticipated move, so we should now actually move our stop to trailing. Level three years, you just did this. Of course, um, uh, there are many different ways you can manage stops. Three high low method would probably be my preferred method. Uh, but you can do things like ATR, moving average close lines, yada, yada, yada. You can see how volatile the stock is through here, though. So you should expect that the market's going to want to fill that gap in and probably also want to fill that gap in. I think at this point, you don't really want to see a winning trade turn into a losing trade. So if we did come back to this 1366, I might just hop off and say, you know what, maybe the, this got a little fluffy and I'm just going to leave it alone. I don't know. Let's see what happens. I might have been, I might get stopped out here uh, the next day. Okay, bit of an up, bit of a down, bit of an up, bit of a down. Okay, so now as we're developing price structure, I kind of like the idea that if I was in this bot, uh, you know, remember, we're here to make money from trading. So we don't really ever want to see a winning trade turn into a losing trade. I think I would be comfortable if we blew through this low. That would be a big M. And maybe we just walk away. And, you know, the end result of this exercise might be Brian uh, booked a big fat profit of that. Well, wow, way to go. You're so awesome, Brian. Who knows? No idea. All right, boom, you can see I'm stopped out. That's exactly what happened. So if anything, great analogy. You know, I don't know where I would have been stopped out, but I get the feeling I probably would have taken a pretty shitty fill. You can see it opened up down here and went down. So maybe that was my total profit on here. At this point, I might be like, okay, well, you know, I did make a little bit of money and I'd like to try and stay in this thing. So let's keep botting away. And let's see whether we get another one that develops in here. 
And we will go boom and boom. So I've been stopped out. Uh, looks like this has gone a bit beyond 66. So I don't think I would feel comfortable using that. I think I might want to, let's maybe come back down against here. And maybe what the hell, why don't we go against the original low? So you notice that because this was beyond 66, eh, I don't think I can use that range for a bot. But we got something that might work here. There's 33. We've got one low. So we've already walked away from the first trade. It'd be really interesting to see whether, it, you know, if another trade does set up, um, whether uh, we can recapture um, this level here. I got a funny feeling we probably can, but let's see what happens. All right, so interesting. So now if we want to get back in on this, what this what the market's saying is it has to recapture the gap and then um, actually accept above this gapping level. I, I have no idea what's going to happen here. We're out of the short uh, little trade. We took a small profit, not much. Uh, this guy here, he's already sold half on a double. And actually, oh, I think he actually got his second off. Yeah, he did. So 865, twice that, that's uh, 16, 17 and change. So he actually got his second double off. Fascinating how the little old lady is sitting there just printing money, not even really over analyzing the market. And Mr. Hey, I'm gonna out trade the market. He's got this little profit right here. <laughs> I don't know who's right here or not, but we'll see what happens. So we've already got that. Let's see if another three higher lows sets up to get us back in this trade. Okay, rallied up. There's back to the bot entry level. Woo, huge spike. I wouldn't touch this. So I would be gone. There would be no sort of swing trade for me, too violent, too volatile here. But fascinating how Mr. Little Old Lady or, you know, Miss Little Old Lady is still working away. So um, at this point, if I wanted to get in on the trade, like I said, this is off the table now. I would draw up my reload zone now. So I'm going to be hunting for any kind of pullback, probably back into these gaps, it's 33 to 66, see if I can sneak in. It might just take off. And if that's the case, my bot setup, my swing setup has been left behind. Do, 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 do. So <clears throat> Mr. Double's already got his second double off. This would actually be of a lot like Doge trade. All right, we're swimming around. We never did, woohoo! All right, so I got left behind here, Mr. Bot. In fact, it looks like that low there, 1708, 1715. Yeah, I just never got anything set up here. Fascinating. Little old lady has an order at, uh, what is that, 36, say $37. And looks like she got another fill. Isn't this fascinating? It's absolutely incredible how these sell half on a double orders happen, and yet the lower time frame traders are kind of frozen out here. It happens all the time, folks. So right now, as a trader, I, you know, as we said there a moment ago, at best, I'm going to have to wait for a 33% correction or 66, see some sort of consolidation for the trade. If it just keeps going, then really the only person who's involved here is little old lady. All right, you can see it bobbing and weaving and poof, we pop to another new high. This is the great, I mean, this is just like what happened in Doge. You never know when these damn doubles will come in. So here you go, another double, 72 bucks, eh? Bang, there's another double. There was no way for you to predict that that was gonna happen. And there was just no way. So here we go again. If I wanted to trade the trade, I'm gonna, Hunt my reload zones. Actually, in this case, bot. I'm just still looking for trend continuation. It's getting to the point now where this is getting really nosebleedy. Do I really want to continue hunting bots? My hunch is bot on this kind of thing. You see this gap down here. You see the distance between 33 and 66. 
My hunch is if there is a bot that's going to set up, it's going to take a lot of time to develop. And of course, we already know what the happened here, right? So market's running. Boom. No way to predict what's going to happen here. But you'll notice little old lady just got off another double. Man, she's crazy. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? So there's little old lady banged out another double. Was there any way for you to, perf to predict that? I don't think so. <laughs> but if you just work your open orders, you get your fills. Merry Christmas. Do I have any trade setups to get me in on this? Well, you saw I had my little trade setup. I did make some money off it, but I pretty much got left behind from a trader's perspective. This thing has just gone absolutely haywire. Well, does the little old lady get another double off? <laughs> I think she did. So, you know, even at this point, right? Hey, little old lady loads up the account and goes, okay, well, I guess I gotta get my order next order working up here. I call me crazy. I don't know what's gonna happen. And boom! <laughs> and actually, this is a really good analogy of what happens in the stock market quite often. Oh, can I go back there? Uh, oh, darn. Um, Okay, let's just stop that. Um, and I, this is why I love working these open orders. So you can see this one. It ran up. It hit the level. Ding, ding, ding. You're filled and then sort of calm down. This one here, this is beautiful because what often happens here when this happens, right? You'll see that that, that was uh, the day, like we said, little old lady sitting at home. She just got filled. She just feels like an absolute genius. The stock's sitting at like $96 a share. She got her fill. And she sits there and goes, okay, well, let's get the order going for the next one. Right up here at $285 or whatever. That's You're insane. That can't happen. Well, let's see what happens. And boom. And this is cool. Because what actually happens in the stock market is if you have your order working here, but you notice the market opens here, you actually get filled up here. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> so again, you just don't know what the hell's going to happen in the market. So a really great analogy of you know somebody who's relatively conservative, relatively slow paced. And I even heard somebody on social media said that they went and like bought their kid like 10 shares of this thing down here. And now the kid's got like three or four grand. Woohoo! But here's a good, and I think that that was actually a pretty good analogy of sort of like that little old lady, don't give a shit, just going to go and buy some and invest in the company. And sometimes the market can just reward you insane like. So what's fascinating about this story is you see all the doubles that we painted. Is this abnormal? This is the killer part about this. So how many doubles is this? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Not bad. Have we done trades like that before? Um, you know, just this is one that I did this year that happens to be pretty much the same kind of thing. So this one I came in, actually, this is the stock, uh, but I came in on the warrants at like 30 cents. So I don't know how many doubles is that. So it's the point that I'm trying to make here. I'm not trying to brag. I couldn't give a fuck what you think and whether you buy this or not. doesn't matter. Came in at 30, so, you know, let's just do the count. 30 to uh, 60, and I, I actually sold at 120. I missed my first uh, double level, but let's just hypothetically say. So there's one, then 120 actually is there, right? I don't know whether you would have gotten a fill, but let's assume there. So there's two, 240, uh, there's uh, three, um, Five bucks, I guess, is the next one. So there's four. Um, Ten dollars would be your next one, but let's assume you didn't get that fill there. So we'll go there. Say five. This uh, then. So six is uh, twenty. So that's there. 
then uh, 6, so that 7 is 40. Uh, and you can see right now, I'm waiting on number 8 here, which will be up in around the, I think it's about 73 or $74. So this is actually a trade that I did do. And of course, you know, all those wonderful doubles. Very proud of the trade. So just the point here is that what you're seeing in the game stock, it's not at unreasonable for stocks to do this. It happens all the time in the market. I mean, this just happens to be one that I'm in. There's tons of names I can show you that have gone 10x, 100x. It, it's just what stocks do, especially when we get into a growth stock environment, which you guys haven't seen uh, you know, probably most of you that are watching this video, you've never actually seen what a growth stock environment actually looks like. And that's why, you know, people like Klaus want to get you out of equity, load up on debt, don't own anything, because he knows that shit that you own, stuff, equity, is actually extremely valuable right now and is probably really undervalued. Um, one thing I've come to learn about this game called investing, and I don't know whether you guys will get this or not. I really don't know. You might, you might not. Um, if you just, you know, I try to tell people this through the sort of Dow, uh, Dow Gold ratio and of course this is a big uh, part of the level one program and of course you know this cycle they've made it incredibly difficult to understand this thanks to all the fucking uh, you know monkeying they're doing with the system through this um, but in essence you know if you can just think sort of like longer term cycles I'm not talking about the next day the next week even really the next year or two, I'm talking like 15, 20 year, sort of the money sloshing around the system. And, you know, I, I uh, this is in essence that image. Now, unfortunately, this uh, gold has dramatically underperformed this cycle. Now, you know, you guys all getting ya ya about silver here. I suppose uh, maybe we'll see it outperform, but I don't think so. I think that cycle is over, and now this is just the other side of the cycle that we're seeing. So the gold and silver might jump up here a bit, but of course, you know, Bitcoin, you know, running at 20, 40 Gs. That's what gold bugs were expecting to happen to gold, and I just don't see that happening. Sorry, gold bugs. Just I, I just don't see it. So the way I actually like to look at this is if you can take like the gold from 1980, that's what this is, and that's that respective cycle, and then you sort of juxtapose, like smash Bitcoin and gold together, well, that's what this cycle picture looks like. The only problem here is I hope you can all see, right? This was back when you guys were all super excited. Actually, there's 2000, right? That's when you should have been a buyer of gold. Uh, that's all in this area here, I guess, like right down in here. I don't know why that's showing there. I think um, I was just trying to do like a comparison. Mind you, that should be a lot wider then. But anyway, point here is that this is that 2000 period when I really was jazzed about commodities. Um, interesting, there is sort of your... Um, I guess you might argue that this is sort of the uh, the peak panic, if you will, of uh, of the financial asset crisis. And of course, Bitcoin was born. Um, and, and then sort of this is the post-Bitcoin being born, Bitcoin and gold as sort of your fear proxies. And I really like this thinking. I, I will admit, I thought that the cycle pivot was there uh, end of 2017, beginning 2018. Um, so you can clearly see there's a hell of a lot more fear still juiced in the system. The only question I have here is that, you know, does this is this really where we want to come in as investors in the hard assets, the physical assets, the raw commodities versus, and remember, what is this relationship? This All this is, is the relationship between hard assets, uh, commodities, hard physical assets versus 
paper assets. And remember, paper is nothing more than just a fakese. It's It is a dream that you are selling. Uh, you know, level oneers today with Grimm, remember, stocks are earnings engines. So the question now is, do I want to go and invest in a Bitcoin at $30,000? Or do I want to go and invest in a company that can use the Bitcoin technology to jack earnings and get earnings going big time? And is this a type of environment where if we build a better mousetrap, the millennials might come online and maybe download our app and maybe, I don't know, use our product? Do you guys see where I'm going with this? I hope you realize I that, you know, actually I did a great conversation with uh, you guys in the last Broiler Chicken show about the difference between Mara, which is a crypto stock. Actually, look, I already have it still written on here. <laughs> if, if it's one good thing about Brian is it's he's consistent. <laughs> I it, My message might be bullshit, but at least I'm consistent. <laughs> the bullshit never changes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um... Okay, so, you know, I want to just compare it versus Bitcoin. Where's, uh, isn't that interesting? So Stamp is not even the top one on the list anymore. God, how times have changed. All right, so, you know, I, I mentioned this last time, right? Pre uh, that cycle change, um, I think you could make the argument that, um, you know, there would be relative rallies, right? So in this case, uh, we've got Bitcoin in orange, Mara, yeah, Mara, I mean, hey, that's a bad 67% rally off the low. But the Bitcoin rallied like 2,400% in that same time period. So you can clearly see preference hard asset over paper asset. And then as we move forward and something changed, right? Then, you know, through this cycle, okay, well, they're relatively equal performing. And then, wow, something just dramatically disconnected here where now you can clearly see paper assets are dramatically outperforming the physical asset. So that's the kind of shift that that gold, silver, Dow, gold, these long-term shifts in sort of the preference for assets in the marketplace. Now, given that change, does it make sense what happened in GameStop from just a just a mental sort of shift of what is value in the marketplace. I mean, I might, and this really wasn't that great of an example of trading, but eh, it served my purposes there. It was kind of a fun walkthrough. But what I want you thinking about here is um, what's the difference in the mental set, mental mindset of uh, an investor through uh, this period from um, go weekly. Oh yeah, see this thing wasn't even around. I you know I it'd be curious to see what the previous form of this thing was, but has the mental mindset of the marketplace changed um, from this kind of environment, right? Because interestingly enough, anybody who's interested in game stock. If I understand correctly, and I don't know, I have a funny feeling there probably is past history, but that's here nor there. But what is the mental mindset of an investor in this type of environment versus what I think is going to happen here? Um, and this reminds me, I mean, the only way I could describe this to the public was think uh, Joe Granville. So, it, you know, you YouTube people, if you want sort of a fun assignment, research a gentleman by the name of Joe Granville. Um, and as sort of a little tip off, and I've talked to you guys about this before, so anybody's watched this before, you know what I, where I'm going with this. But uh, Mr. Granville, to sort of give you a hint, he turned extremely bearish of the US equity market right at the end of the last respective fear cycle. All right, that was the fear cycle of the uh, post-World War II generation and the baby boomers sort of just being born and growing up and then the baby boomers took, off, took over the economy. 
So, you know, like think senior bush, right? This was their respective fear cycle. And then at this point, the baby boomers, just like the millennials are now, came online. And this is what I think GameStop and kind of, you know, AMC, I think is another one where they got the shorts on the run. I'm hearing you guys talking about they want to do some sort of short squeeze on silver. Well, what I really think it is, is it's sort of the people that are still short GameStop are Joe Granville here. And they're not understanding that there has been a major shift in the demographic makeup of our society and what to expect going forward. It's fascinating times we live in, my friends. I'll tell you that much by crackers. So this image, you know, you can see the similarities and this is what I've drawn as to what we should expect going forward. What do you think? I mean, is Brian slightly bullish of growth? <laughs> I mean, I'd be really curious to see what happens here going forward, but that's pretty much what I'm expecting. Would that be more of those game stocks going to like $300 an ounce? Or an ounce. Huh. 300, silver going to $300 an ounce. That's probably what I wanted to say. But uh, the game stock going to uh, $300 a share. And, you know, the people that are like, well, we're still in this environment and these stocks are overvalued and the demographics say that the uh, baby boomers are leaving money. Uh, they're leaving the economy. So, you know, unfortunately, what ends up happening through this type of environment is, of course, yields get really squeezed. So uh, people like hedge fund managers, I love this. Where the fuck did this hedge fund manager term come from? A hedge fund is technically anybody who got lucky on a stock pick and it went zooming up. And then they go out and say, hey, I want to raise a bunch of private money and do more of what I just did here. And people go, okay, well, here's a pile of money. Go and invest it for me. Boom, you are now a hedge fund manager. Uh, so no license. No university degrees. No sort of, are you actually qualified to be a hedge? There's some guy, I love it. There's some guy on YouTube. He fancies himself a crude oil expert. And every single call I've heard him make about crude oil has been completely wrong. And in his show introduction, I, I'm this guy. Hedge fund manager. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> You're only a hedge fund manager if you do not advertise that you are a hedge fund manager. You want to fly under the wire, under the radar. Nobody even knows you exist. So if somebody publicly comes out and says they are a hedge fund manager, my advice to you Turn your tail and head the exact opposite direction. That's got trouble written all over it. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know what? I think I got to take a vape. Uh, Shane reminded me I should probably load up on the nicotine here. There you go, Slick. That that hoot was for uh, for Shane. And this, of course, is... Nicotine, a 100% legal. <laughs> but honestly, folks, if somebody is publicly advertising themselves as a hedge fund manager, uh, that that's got disaster written all over it. Not that's not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. So anyway, uh, you know, if anything, what I would suggest is uh, just let people's track records speak for themselves, and they should publicly tell you what they're trading. And if you like the idea, take the trade yourself, right? Make sure it meets your plan, your risk criteria, blah, 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 blah. If a guy's any good, he doesn't need to be a hedge fund manager. He'll just manage his own money. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. I hate that kind of stuff. Terrible. I mean, really, we should put Wall Street out of business. This whole hedge fund nonsense is garbage. All it is is some rich guy sitting there going, I don't want to do the work. You do the work for me. I mean, that's literally what hedge funds are. And, you know, the irony of it all is they actually do studies of fund managers. And fund managers are funny creatures. Like, I used to work with a guy 
And he's like, big wig and uh, on the floor of the exchange right now, oh, prop fund manager and oh, CNBC and all that. And what he used to do, and this is great, man. I love this. He used to run a fund of funds. So he had a, a, a fund, right, a hedge fund, but he would actually pit all of the hedge funds against each other because he knew that every fund manager has his own style, right? You've heard Brian talking about like reload zones and buy W's and momentum divergence or, you know, like my venture capital model lately, uh, looking for corporations where they've recently restructured their the capital stock and insiders have been granted uh, derivatives to purchase equity in the company at certain valuation levels and uh, indebted individuals relinquish uh, past debts in uh, in consideration of restructuring of companies well i mean the point here is that there's a million different ways to skin this cat. And every hedge fund manager has their own style. You know, these guys, these uh, the GameStop guys, I mean, no offense, you know what should happen here? The guys should be put out of business. They did a stupid trade. They should go bankrupt. The people that invested in their hedge fund should lose their capital. That's the way the game of capitalism works. It's really simple. And my hunch is, at the end of all this, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Lots of bluster. And if anything, Wall Street, I think, made a major blunder here. Um, and keep in mind, Wall Street, they're humans just like you and I. They're greedy. They're fearful. They do... You know, the worst part about it is, uh, you know, they, they put this sort of evil mask, Wall Street hedge fund. They're just people, just like you and I. And unfortunately, they're susceptible to two key words, fear and greed, just like you and I. I get the impression that people that were shorting stocks like GameStop, 140% of the shares outstanding are short. That doesn't make any sense. I get the impression that these people were getting a little bit desperate, a little bit greedy, taking too much risk, not actually doing solid work. They were just kind of hoping that, you know, with COVID, with the malls collapsing, that these companies would just declare bankruptcy and go out of business and the stock price would go to zero. But something happened on the way to the party and this is actually a really important message to all of you are the people that are running our society are they prepared do they want to see equity and my feeling is it's more about real estate valuations but do they want to see those numbers go down and the answer is an unequivocal no. So they will do everything and anything in their power, a la Japanification, because that's exactly what I think is going to happen to our society here, just to make sure that does not happen. But in that environment, are bankruptcies likely to happen? No. The, and this is the most important message out of all of this. Let's see if you people on YouTube understand this. I mean, this is like religion in the market. Why people don't say this now? I don't know. Don't fight the... What's the next word? Let's see if you people on YouTube can answer this. <laughs> and I love lecturing to you people. It's so much fun. <laughs> no. Hey, somebody finally got it right. That sounds... Uh, rhymes with... Uh, a famous horse? <laughs> the Fed. Don't fight the Fed. The Fed came in last March and April with bazookas. We all know that, right? 
I mean, that's that's news. It's not like it's speculation. They came in with bazookas. Burr, Shane's burrs, right? Burzookas. <laughs> Is that what we should, we should call them? Burzookas? <laughs> I think we just coined a new term here. Right on. <laughs> Burzooka. <laughs> um... And every time the market has shown any weakness over the past year or so, what has been the message from the Fed? Is this really an environment that you really want to be aggressively short if the bankers who basically run our society are publicly say saying, they are publicly saying, we will do whatever it takes to support asset prices. We are in crisis. We will extend credit. There will be no forbearance. Do you really want to fight that? Are you really going to expect companies to be driven into bankruptcy in that? Ironically enough, this is such a great lesson for the level oneers because we teach through this particular week that ironically enough, bankruptcy is not the worst thing that can happen to you if you own stock. And we've had about three or four different stocks over the past year that have all gone into bankruptcy and the goddamn stocks have doubled. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why? Because now the bankruptcy courts are actually protecting the companies from the creditors. The creditors cannot foreclose. The Fed has said, hey, you want money? Come and just talk to us. We'll be more than happy to give you all the credit you want. Are you really going to expect the market to collapse in the face of that? That's not the way capitalism works. Usually, and write this fucking down, everybody. Usually the stock market breaks and it collapses and the politicians and the bankers just stand there and do nothing and they say nothing. That is exactly what happened through the entirety of 2008. It was only when George Bush Jr. and I got to say just stunningly corrupt uh, GOP, I mean Darth Cheney, I mean... We look back in history. I mean, it's going to be laughable how fucking corrupt that whole thing was. But the point here is they got away with it. Nothing you can do now. I mean, how many trillions of dollars did those people suck out of the U.S. economy through either, you know, nefarious military spending or, you know, a deregulation of the financial services institution or uh, uh, industry? So Goldman Sachs can literally write somebody a mortgage and then in the same breath take the opposite side of the trade of the mortgage at the same table. I mean, that's terrible. <laughs> so where, where am I going with all of this? You cannot make the argument that Wall Street isn't culpable here. Wall Street is as much to blame for our society ills right now as anybody, and probably more so, because they are inherently greedy. And what I noticed with this uh, issue around GameStop, which could be a very interesting catalyst here, is for the past 20 years, I have listen consistently and very rarely does the left and the right come together and say yes we both agree this is horrific in fact through mr trump's years the past four years they have not agreed on one single thing have they but all of a sudden all of the politicians are like yes this is the problem and that's a bit scary for you capitalists uh, we, uh, and I, you know, ironically enough, just like you haven't been through a growth period, I don't think you've, uh, uh, many of you have actually even experienced it. We had it briefly for two years there where uh, the capital markets were literally by, held by the short and curlies. Turns out at that time, the Democrats were obsessed with this health care reform. So that was the part of the market that they went after. But, you know, it, Wall Street better be damn careful here. And especially with this whole sort of uh, CME event around these Ethereum cryptocurrency launches, I get the impression that everything was on schedule for a big fucking, Just like the Bitcoin CME listing, in my opinion, 
was the most beautiful crypto fucking you could possibly have. I, there, I said it. Merry Christmas. I think Wall Street and Wacker Street were on schedule to do the same thing this go round. But something's gone wrong here. So, yeah. Well, I tell you, man, that CME event, that was textbook. It was absolutely textbook. And, like, literally, people lost fortunes through that. So, um, so the point that I just want to make here is, you know, just be careful. Especially, you know, over the next year or so. This is dangerous environment, people. Very dangerous. And the last thing in the world we want to hear is the politicians all saying, yes, it's time we gang up on Wall Street. If that's the case, then Wall Street will just pull the plug and prices will collapse. And it may not be straight down, but it might be like a year or two of just a grinding bear. And of course, you all remember after the fucking, what did we have to do in Bitcoin following that? So, ironically enough, actually, crypto might do okay through this environment as sort of an alternative. I don't know. It's going to be a tough one. Um, Seward was mentioning, uh, and there, there's my rant. I have no idea how long that was. Long rant. There you go. Rant, 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 rant. Um, you know, people wanted to get my input on sort of the environment and the whole game stock issue, and that's sort of what I wanted to speak to there. Uh, somebody on the site did not mention, uh, and seward has been working on it, so just FYI if you're coming on, uh, his breadth data is not quite updating right now, so a little bit concerned there about that. Can't really report through these videos. I want to get to the point where I can actually use this data on a daily basis, so we're just grinding our way through getting this thing uh, working, but I did see that the uh, the data on the engine stalling out a little bit, so let's keep on keeping on. Um, so I can't really use this, unfortunately. I would like to, but can't really use it today with this conversation. Hopefully we can get this thing up and running here ASAP. Um, I suppose if we just talk about uh, broader market very quickly, then we'll just get into the Q&A. Um, we have January barometer right now going on. So uh, usually there's an old adage in the market, as January goes, so goes the rest of the year. So it's good to sort of just keep an eye on what trader sort of temperament is. And I have to say, things were looking pretty sort of, eh, pretty normal. You know, nice little winter uh, bottom, a bit up into the spring, um, sell in May and walk away into uh, end of June, July 4th weekend pivot rally into the uh, summer and then into the early uh, fall people come back from labor day weekend uh, september october we look for a dump in the market uh, and then usually we see the market firm up into the end of the year and we finish relatively well you notice that something went wrong here uh, into the close uh, on thursday friday so I tell you, we've actually printed a negative uh, January barometer report. So uh, I got a sneaky suspicion this year is going to be a bit of a challenge. And then here's the issue. I know you crypto people hate this stuff. But I believe that crypto is very much a risk asset, just like things like commodities like oil and, and stocks. Um, I'm curious to see how the bond market is going to act here. Um, I don't think that the first half of 2021 is the problem. I think actually the problem comes next fall. Um, I get the feeling we're going to be sort of vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. People are going to be like, okay, you know, things are okay. We're doing all right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're heading in a good direction. And then heading into next fall, I got a sneaky suspicion there's going to be one more COVID. Oh, goodness. And I got a feeling it's probably going to, it, it's going to be sort of it, very debilitating for the public. Um, so just be forewarned. That, that's kind of what I'm thinking here. And don't be surprised. Number one, the end of the summer, you're probably going to hear Brian talking about buying puts and wanting to buy puts and stuff on the stock market. 
And then number two, you know, they always call, you know, September's the worst performing stock uh, month in the stock market. September, October, that's usually where crashes develop kind of stuff. So don't be surprised that once we get through summer, especially in things like crypto, once we're through the summer silly season, we got to really start tightening things up. Because be forewarned, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the first six months of the year are okay. I think we're probably going to have to have a bit of a dip here into February like we had last year. Uh, we'll see how it goes. If the uh, Fed bazooka keeps coming out, though, I don't expect that sell-off to be too steep. Um... You know, as for uh, Bitcoin in particular, unfortunately, you know, it's the same conversation. Ironically enough, it's the same conversation as GameStop. I mean, you could argue that that's the same thing that happened there. Maybe this was a short squeeze in all of these assets. Could very well be. Um, I don't think so. If it was, we probably would have heard more about it. Uh, but you know, just j this is this is just yet another game stock, as far as I'm concerned. What I don't like here is, of course, the fact that you know, if you look at this chart, let's call a spade a spade here, people. This has you know, let's say if we change this to a line, right? You can see big old smiley face. It's there. You know, if you ignored the smiley face uh, back in uh, the summer of uh, 2019, well, you know, you see what happened. If you ignored the smiley face uh, from 2017, 2018, you, know, you see what happens. So uh, I, you have to respect the fact that the smiley face is there. You have to respect that. I mean, it's it just it, it's there. There's no fighting that. Um, also, too, remember that ETH, right, is the focal point of this. So it does make sense. And also, you know, I find this incredible that basically this was, in essence, the United States of America, pretty much massive fear apex event there. So I do like Bitcoin just as 1980 gold was its particular fear asset apex peak proxy. I do like this Bitcoin uh, vote, especially the way price was acting through this um, as as uh, as a peak. Yeah, I, I am. That's uh, everybody like boo, hiss, hiss, boo, hiss, boo. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if that that was our cycle peak here, folks. But we'll see. Uh, hopefully I'm wrong. Um, looks like we just had an inside bar actually just fire here. I don't know whether this did this just happen now. Um, hmm. Interesting. Um, you know, you can see from my funny little trend line um, screen, this is, ironically enough, uh, I'm doing this off of the screen that I normally do the, the, uh, the uh, daily brief recap video. So I really shouldn't even be looking at a one hour chart. So kind of messed up probably <laughs> great analogy for 2020 i suppose or 2021 um so i was watching uh these fast trend lines off of this bottom which came in off of this trend line of course there's a w on the other side of the trend line so it sets up two to one and boom away she goes uh big rally up top there's not really much you can do up here so uh turns out boom come right back yeah, if I wanted to see another buy signal, I'd probably want to see a nice pullback against these lows. Then a counter trend rally. Uh, let's see, how should we do this? I'll just eyeball it. Counter trend rally up against these highs, right? And then eh, consolidation. Then give me a W on the other side of the trend line, and away we go. We got a new trade set up. So the fact that that didn't develop at all, and also, too, you can sort of see how, like, it didn't develop through here either, and it was just a cascade lower. It looks to me like, actually, this is almost like a carbon copy, eh, that's going on here. So I wouldn't be surprised if the end of this move that's happening right now probably looks almost identical to this. And, you know, if we do want to hunt uh, new buy setups, let's try and get some Ws at trend line. So you can see... We've got a level that's trying to form here. Can we get a nice W here? And actually, I can see a cute little one. 
right eh, maybe we can even go there to there and it's probably more like this there to there so we might get a nice little buy setup if we can get some we action but you can see if anything that's probably your range right now and these are like straight line moves eh? so not really any structure here to work with at the lower time frame I would just be, you know, just hands off. There's nothing really to do there for a guy like me. Um, you know, heading on over to good old Ethereum. I have noticed that I'm a bit surprised. Yes, I mean, this is supposed to be a bull. So let's get our ass back up top here. And now we've gone and put in a whole bunch of M's up here. That's not so good. If anything at best, what I see here right now is uh, just simply, uh, you know, and interesting, it's higher, high, higher, high, higher, high. So they keep washing out the stops. But for the time being, that's basically what I see as a trading range there. And that's ugly. You know, you know, basically what that's saying is the POC is the bottom. If they lose the POC, then obviously we have to come down to value low, right? So you can see the, the POC has been basically this pivot point here, right? That through there, that through there, that low, all these. So you can see... The market's sort of spending half its time below this level, below this level, and it just dipped there but didn't accept. Then it's spending like half its time above this level, above this level, above this level. So, you know, you can clearly see if we lose this level, then we're probably going to have to come back down and do this kind of stuff, right? And you can see, look at that big old tail there. Trade location against those tails. Bottom of value, you know, Mr. Hoagland sitting down there. Yeah, this is just gobbledygook. And the worst part about the gobbledygook is, remember, Brian's a cheap ass. So this is gobbledygook at very expensive prices. So I can't even, like, justify nanny nibbling here. Oh, you know what, man, I'll just come in and buy against the bottom end of the range here. No big deal. I mean, look at this chart off the higher time frame. It's like, oh, you serious? You want me to come in up here? I mean, look at this. <laughs> I was uh, telling uh, Shane and uh, Andrew in our little chat room on the site, man, fuck, I want to go buy some more puts. And they're like, shut up. <laughs> but uh, I was putting this message out uh, recently. A guy like me, I can't touch this because we could very easily pop up top. And, you know, maybe if you're an aggressive trader, I'm going to try and sneak my way in long to play that move. But if we start puking out here, be damn careful, man. This is all just crazy-ass open air down in here. Got some pretty wild tails. So you can see there's going to be some chop here. What I would just simply say, you know, remember that conversation we just had about Bitcoin. I think I really like using this trend line here and just simply saying, look, if we lose this trend line and then we go and put an M in below that trend line, it's over. So... We're flirting with disaster. It's interesting how this M right here is coming in just above the trend line. I've seen when that happens. Sometimes you'll get like a head fake move, and then the thing will just jackknife right back up to the trend line. So watch out for that move. I wouldn't be surprised. But the point here is I don't even really want to do anything here because you got this big fucking unknown event coming up here on the 8th. Once we're on the other side of that, well, all bets are off. I don't know what the hell's going to happen. There's no fundamental drivers. And then what I would say is, uh-oh, is that just an inside bar failure there? So, you know, if I wanted to be bullish, and I, at the very least, I got to see some sort of inside bar bullish action here. Um, very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. And so... You can see I put, if we do pull back to this, the message I sort of said was, Houston, there's a problem. Something didn't go right. And this is actually exactly like that Wall Street bets kind of conversation. I think if everybody was happy with Wall Street and the bankers and stuff, this thing would have been orgy central and they would have sucked you all in and you would have bought this line, hook, line, and sinker, and you would have been in love with this thing, and it's the next best thing since sliced bread, and then they would have just fucked you, right? The fucking ink. If anything, it's probably better that this thing kind of craps out, and this actually becomes a sell the rumor 
And then that actually sets the base. Remember, I've, all, I've said repeatedly, if we could somehow get a pullback down into this reload zone, this, I think, represents like the buying opportunity of a lifetime. So I would prefer that we do not get fuckened, if that is a term, and we set up the buying opportunity of a lifetime, please. Can I have that? I'd appreciate that. I don't want to see us go up and then have to crash back down the other side because that, to me, that scenario is going to be, well, crypto's all a fraud and look how everybody got totally screwed over and we need to regulate this shit into the ground. If anything, I would prefer CME go away, make this a quiet event, market comes off, all the stocks, Bitcoin, ETH, everything comes off because we're all freaked out about COVID. This doesn't sell off because of crypto. It sells off because of some other reason. And that's what actually set up the killer buys last year in all of these damn things. And I keep telling you guys about Kevin and his fucking killer trade. Why did Bitcoin dump here? It did not dump here because of Bitcoin. And that's the kind of shit you really want to watch out for. When prices dump because of COVID, interest rates, the Fed, capitalism is over, which is a silly statement anyway, and not because of Bitcoin, well, that sets up that kind of shit on the other side. And then, of course, Fed comes in, guarantees the market, don't fight the Fed. Well, that's what usually happens on the other side of the Fed coming in and guaranteeing the market. All right. Rant, 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 rant. Now let's get on to your questions. I uh, sure hope you guys are enjoying the offering today. I don't know. I mean, uh, I, uh, I don't even think I stopped for a breath of air through that. <laughs> let alone let you guys actually respond. <laughs> you know what? In fact, on that note, I'm going to go take a piss. <laughs> so I'll be right back. <laughs> and while I'm taking a piss, I'm going to have a who to vape. Shane, Shane, this is your time to shine. Meow, 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 I can't. I just can't. I got to stop. But I'll help you fill the air so no one can hear you pee. But yeah, welcome to the Broly Chicken Show. Meow. And meow. And. I mean, anyone else would like to make some animal noises? I can't be the only one. I know all of you want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, no. Make a pee noise? I could try. I could, yeah. I'd rather just try to embarrass him um, via his neighbors. I know he's got the volume nice and loud. <laughs> my Russian neighbor? How's my Russian neighborhood doing? I think she's pretty nice to me, but her I think I, I think it's her brother. He does not like me at all. Maybe his boyfriend, who knows? Alright, so Shane is uh with did some fun color commentary there while I was uh, relieving myself. Hope you guys enjoyed that. What, what were you I hope you weren't swearing, because uh that doesn't show good form. But no were you, right? You never swear on these videos. Uh, yeah, but if you're trying to get her attention, what are you going? Hey, you fucking run your goodness! <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you took the bait. That's all I have to do. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, that's what you want? You wanted me to swear? All right, there you go. Um, okay, uh, where should we go? We were going to do questions, weren't we? So um, this was from the class. This isn't the one that I wanted to work off of, though, is it? Uh, where is Kevin? Did you uh, post that in here? I know I don't know that Kevin or Sharky's in here today. Let's see. Hey, there we go. Let's see what this does. Survey says. Uh, boom. All right. Holy Jesus! Look at you guys. Going to work me hard here today. Okay. Um. How are you guys doing over on YouTube? You guys okay? <laughs> Just gonna take a vape. 
see if anybody on YouTube's listening. Hey, there they are. Man, that's pretty delayed, eh? Took a while. Hey, Quinn. Okay, so uh, the purpose of this here is to just simply address questions that the uh, current level one students may have had that uh, might have been above uh, Grimm's pay grade, who knows? Um, or, you know, maybe he was just like, uh, well, I'll leave that uh, for Brian to answer. Um, the students worked him pretty good this morning. Um, and uh, actually, I was pretty impressed. He kept his calm while uh, we had some technological issues. Uh, but I think uh, we got through it. And like I said, I think a lot of people uh, felt as though uh, uh, me stepping in there and just helping out was a benefit. Uh, I don't think we uh, did the... Uh, you know, I added my two cents uh, to his already uh, conversation. He was able to get back up and running, and we let the uh, call uh, continue. And I think, well, on balance, it worked pretty well for everybody. So super pleased to see uh, TRI's flexibility. So let's dig in, see what we got here, and if we can help answer some questions. So uh, first one here, hello Brian, uh, this is more off topic question, hope you don't mind. Can you please advise a good educational path to learn about taxes? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Even half the tax experts don't even know what the hell the damn tax code is. <laughs> um, unfortunately, no, I can't. And then every country is different, it drives you nuts. You would think that there would be like a uh, um, a um, generally accepted uh, um, policy, but it's shocking how even as you go, you know, from country to country to country, everything is different. So unfortunately, I can't. What I would suggest, I don't know whether you're in Canada or not, but uh, you can always, uh, you know, the Canadian government has a pretty robust website, so you can always jump on there and uh, party in there. Uh, as well, too, the big six accounting firms. I used to work for one of them, but uh, actually when I worked for them, they were called Coopers and Librand. But, man, that was about four or five mergers ago. I think they're called uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers now. I don't know. Uh, that, uh, so I found that and and each of these uh, big uh, six firms has, uh, you know, uh, local offices. So we had a Vancouver office and I worked in that office. And each office has its own uh, respective department. And frankly speaking, that's probably where I would really strongly suggest that you go, like where you actually get professional tax advice. Um, and keep in mind, this, you know, this is dangerous stuff because uh, you say something to somebody and they do something, but it turns out that that was incorrect. Well, number one, you're legally liable if you had some sort of advisory role. Um, and then number two, you know, uh, there might be actually like a actual financial ramification uh, of that, uh, that advice, if you will, and that might have been completely erroneous. So unfortunately, and it sucks, I mean, I want to say, oh, yeah, you know what, uh, I'm Mr. Smarty Pants, just do this, 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 and this, and you're good to go. I can't. I mean, taxes are brutal, eh? I mean, uh, hey, we could go off on a tangent of what are taxes and talk a little bit about the banking system and uh, how, in essence, uh, this this whole sort of tax structure is really nothing more than just organized slavery. So we could go that direction with a conversation. But to actually give you specific uh, advice, uh, specifically where to go to learn how to actually do your local taxes correctly. Uh, I can't. It sucks. Good thing here is I don't, I do not tout myself as uh, anything about TRI as anything to do with taxes. Um, we just, we just don't touch it. it. Sucks, but it is what it is. Uh, international tax, but I'm not sure. Maybe you have good advice based on your experience as a financial planner, your certification, and so on. Yeah. You know, anything that I would say is just uh, talking out my ass. And uh, I might say something that is completely wrong. So it's probably better that I just don't say anything at all. Sorry, man. I'm hoping that this question is good for BCS. Can you please describe the differences between long shorts and leverage shorts and longs? 
Who tends to uh, who tends to do the leverage cells, and why? I'm trying to understand in the context of what recently happened with Game. Is that that Game stock stock you're talking about? Um. Hmm. Where do you begin with this? Uh, long just means it's industry jargon for I own this thing. Short is industry jargon for I went and borrowed this asset from another person and I sold that borrowed asset into the marketplace. At some point, the person that I borrowed the asset from, they're going to want it back. Um, and uh, who knows what price it's going to be when I have to give it back to them. So based on just that simple description, long and short should be pretty easy to understand. Uh, you either own something, right? you bought it with money, or you've gone and borrowed something from somebody else and you've sold it into the marketplace, i.e. a net short position. And at some point, you're going to have to give that asset back to whoever you borrowed it from. Leveraged means that you may have done the transaction uh, with borrowed money. So in the marketplace, you can uh, put down a portion of the cost of something and the brokerage house will put up the other portion for the cost of something. That's what's called margin trading. Usually typical margin rates, 20%, 30%. So. You know, stock's $100, you put up $20, $30, and actually some brokerage houses will give you even higher margin rates. But you put up $20, and the brokerage house will lend you the other $80 to buy the $100 stock. They're going to charge you interest on that $80 loan. So that would be like a leveraged long position. I own this stock that's $100, but I only put $20 up. It's a leveraged position. All right, who can tell me what would be the leverage on that ratio? If I put $20 down and the stock is $100, what's my leverage? It's a pretty simple question. Yes, <laughs> that's not what I'm looking for. Anyone? Yeah, now I've tuned in. As soon as I start going into the math, everybody just tunes me out. What was the question? What? what? Anyway. <laughs> hey, very good, Quinn. Quinn finally answered. Thank you. Yeah, somebody's listening. <laughs> <coughs> well, twenty dollars on a hundred would be like five to one. So what that really means is. For every $1 movement in the asset, you see a $5 movement in your underlying value, All right? Remember, $1 is your 20 bucks. Uh, $5 is the whole $100. Anyway, point of the matter, and I use just the raw dollar figure there to hopefully make it easier to understand we could go the per share route, <laughs> right? Which will drive you crazy. Where I'm going to, and this is the way the futures industry works, is I'm going to um, buy this huge contract, um, which is a massive amount, right? Like crude oil, a thousand barrels of crude oil at like $50 a barrel. Well, that's 50 grand. In that case, the leverage is in actual fact in the futures contract. I, all I do is I put up what's called collateral to control that contract. 
They call that a margin requirement, initial margin requirement, then maintenance margin. But in essence, it's the same logic as our $20, $100 scenario. It's the exact same thing. They just, they happen to call it a performance bond to try and confuse the public as much as possible. So, margin, we explain margin long, right? Margin owning the stock. Stock's $100, you put up 20, brokerage house puts up 80. You could do the same thing going on the short side. You could uh, go and sell, uh, borrow the asset in the marketplace put up $20 of the $100 in collateral and have the brokerage house finance the other $80. Same logic, just going the other direction. And in fact, uh, what usually happens if you want a short stock is the brokerage house will say, great, you know, we'll go and borrow the stock for me out on the street. But you actually have to have 150% of the stock's value in your account in like cash or you know a marginable asset because they do not want to take the chance of a game stock happening and if you don't have a hundred and fifty percent of the value of the stock in your account they will just liquidate the short and cover their asses so very simply put we've described what longs are we've described what shorts are We've described what leveraged longs are, which I guess is a little bit backwards here. And to a certain degree, we've described what leveraged shorts are. Right? Just think that margin conversation. There's one piece of this game stock story that is a little bit more complicated that uh, probably you know is beyond the level one program that you even need to worry about this uh you know very simply put we, nobody at tri has any business being having open short positions on anything that's just asking for trouble and nobody at tri does anything like that and they better not or else they will officially lose their tri license <laughs> if there is such a thing um the one missing component of this conversation is actually there's two but well okay <laughs> now we're getting into it okay so there's two parts of this the first part is is this actually a good short and the kids on the street pointed out that um, you know that Wall Street bets that kind of stuff but I don't think it shows in here yeah okay so it does so you can see the the amount of stock that's actually short of the entire float is greater than 100 percent of the actual stock outstanding that doesn't make any sense so people have gone out and they've remember there's 65 million shares out in the marketplace so technically They've gone out and they've borrowed, uh, who's got a calculator? 65 times 1.22, we'll say. Somebody do that number quick. Anyone? <laughs> Somebody? Anyway, the street's gone out and borrowed that much stock. So that means they've gone out and borrowed stock. Then they've gone out and borrowed more uh, stock. Wait, how can you borrow more than 100% of the stock outstanding? This is like, this. Is, if anything, this is a warning sign that th they're just too short. <laughs> so that's a problem in the marketplace unto itself. And the Wall Street kids probably found out about this and were like, hey, you know, that, that, you know, that could be susceptible to a short squeeze. Why? Because there's more people short in the marketplace than there is shorts outstanding. Thank you. 79.3. Way to go. So there's 79.3 million shares short of this company, and there's only 65 million shares long. How does that make sense? <laughs> but 
you know, this is crazy derivatives and hedge fund managers that can just keep going and shorting, and I'll just keep borrowing the stock and shorting. And then they borrow the stock from people that they borrowed again. I'll just keep shorting. This is an anomaly. There's a there's an inherent problem. And the long and short of it here is what these people were hoping was that the company would go into bankruptcy and then they would cover all of these shorts at the stock at zero. And then they go and give the share cert back to the people that they borrowed from. But this is an inherent problem. How can you be more short the amount of stock than there is stock in the marketplace? It just doesn't make sense. And the Wall Street bet people noticed this. Remember I said the past 10, 20 years, especially, you know, post dot com blow up and financial crisis and all that and then COVID, you know, the thing to do has been short these names that are brick and mortar and just drive them into the ground. Well, I think Wall Street got a little bit carried away and they got caught. That's what's happened here, folks. Wall Street got greedy, stupid, and they got caught and they've got their fucking nuts in the ringer right now. And frankly speaking, these people should be put out of business. They should be the guy that, you know, in Monopoly, goes straight to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That's what should happen to these people. Now, the big controversy right now is these people are so influential that they called up their buddies at Goldman Sachs or whatever the fuck firm it is and said, hey, uh, we can't go out of business. We kind of like the taste of caviar and champagne. Would you mind fucking with the system to make sure that we don't go out of business? And that is the problem. And that's why I think people on the left and the right in Washington, this is something that they can unite around. You're not allowed to do that in our society. And when the both the left and the right find a scapegoat that they can focus the energy on, it's no longer us versus them, it's all of us pile on this fucker, then watch out. <laughs> I uh, wouldn't want to be this guy right now, that's for sure. But hey, made a stupid bet, uh, got greedy, lazy, and these people are being punished by the market right now. And they should be punished. You take too big a risk, what happens if you go and mortgage your house and you buy Bitcoin and Bitcoin goes down in price? Is anybody going to come and say, oh, no problem, you know, here's your money back. But people make these kind of outlandish bets all the time. On this particular one, they went greedy to the short side and they're getting fucked. I warned a colleague of mine about making claims like, oh, go sell your house and go all in on this asset. You do that and this kind of shit can happen to you. Don't do it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Does that sort of help uh, Kate... Kate Kate, Katrin, Katrin, are you here? Oh, it took about 20 minutes to get the answer out. All right, well, I hope it did. If it didn't help, uh, just PM me, and I'll be more than happy to try and help you a bit more. And we'll walk you through daily briefs and stuff, talk a little bit more about this. All right, next question. Hi, BB. What do you think of Reddit kids? Eh, they're just more market participants. I mean, do you really think they was be able to short squeeze a hedge fund? No, you know what I think happened here? And this is so funny, right? Typical fucking Wall Street. Typic so typical Wall Street. <laughs> let, let me ask you this. I mean, I don't know. How much stock did these... Uh, did, didn't they halt like trading in these uh, things on Robin and stuff like this? You're not allowed to actually trade this shit anymore? Do you really think all of this volume here was all these Wall Street kids? Come on. I mean, seriously. Wall Street has a really nasty secret. And the, the secret goes something like this. When... All right, let me ask you this question. Whoever asked this question, this is a great fucking leading question because thank you, I've been thinking about this, so perfect. But what happens if you have a tank of piranha and you take like an eyedropper and you drop 
one droplet of blood into the the tank of piranha what what do you think happens uh maybe what why don't we will say instead of that being a, a no anybody anybody get, get an idea where i'm going with this uh let's say instead uh, of that droplet of blood we're gonna throw one of uh, shane's kitties in that tank what do you think happens <laughs> poor kitty <laughs> didn't stand a chance <laughs> This is the this is the nasty secret of of Wall Street. And oh, by the way, you know Wall Street right now is being very uh, coy. But do you think that maybe people on Wall Street could sniff blood? Do you think that maybe they could see identify a a weak wildebeest that's trotting across the savannah but you can see that it's got a limp and it's falling behind the herd a little bit what do you think those those lions are thinking do you think hey you know what we're gonna let this wildebeest off eh, give him a break no big deal eh, he looks a little lame but what the hell i mean what are those lions gonna do so that's what i think's actually going on here is uh but it's a dirty secret right and they will focus the attention they will focus the the uh the pile on on an avenue that's a nice easy conduit for them but make no mistake about it i think wall street smells blood and they're gonna punish. it's not really like they're gonna punish them but this guy's weak these, this this hedge fund guy who has this trade on it's a stupid trade and it's just like joe granville all my level one students it's the same thing as joe granville it's identical um and i think wall street sniffs blood and they, they got the guy by the short and curlies and they're gonna fuck him um there's an image for you so you want to blame the wall street kids eh, i think uh, they're just they're like a sign of the times they're, they're part of the landscape. And if you didn't expect that to happen, locking everybody in their fucking cubicles and laser beam focused on their computer screens and focused in on Google and Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and just laser beam focused on the stock market and guys on bar stools who say that, hey, picking stocks is easy. Anybody can make money at this. And then you see something like this happen. You shouldn't be surprised. This is business as usual. What I do find amusing is the backlash from both the left and the right about how these Wall Street guys have are caught here. And uh, boo-hoo, uh, I mean, who's really going to give any this guy any pity? And really, he doesn't deserve any pity. Anybody who comes to Wall Street and fancies them a player, if they go down, they don't deserve your pity. Because I guarantee you, when they're on top, they do not pity back. They're assholes. They're jerks. They're fuckers. So uh, that's half of the reason why I don't live that world. You know, I was right there between the fucking CME uh, Dow Futures boys and the CME ES Futures, the S&P 500, the big boys. We were right there at the center of the universe. I could go right back and live in that life again if I want to. But you all know my crazy ass mission here, right? Weird, Brian. <laughs> all right uh let's see so uh what do you think uh, whoever asked this question does that uh, uh, uh alessandra alessandro does that help uh, are you here i hope you're here all right well uh, i hope that that gives you an idea of what i'm thinking um as rational investors can we take advantage from the reading kids well I think as I walked you through that game stock story, what would I be doing as they keep bidding the price of this asset up? Selling into the rally, taking profits, right? Like the kid, uh, great story somebody shared on the lounge. And actually, I love this idea. Somebody shared this story in the lounge. Kid, like, uh, I think, like a little old lady. But uh, I think either her son or her grandson, 10 shares of game stock. 
And, uh, you know, it was like, what, 50 bucks or something. <laughs> Goes zipping up. It's like three, 4,000. The kid's like, hey, I'm rich. And what I really liked, and I think I'm going to try and do this, but uh, I'll wait for your feedback. You guys tell me whether this is a good idea or not. But I wouldn't mind trying to go find the kid and say, okay, you've got your capital base now. And it's like three or $4,000, which is plenty enough. Well, I took 500, turned it into hundreds of thousands. Anybody can do this. Let's put that money away now, right? It's just going to sit there in the bank, in your pillow, whatever, in te well, maybe not tether. That might be a bit dangerous. But, you know, you're just going to leave it alone. And why don't you come to TRI? We'll buy you the level one course. And let's teach you how to take that 3,000 or whatever it is and turn it into more money than you ever need for the rest of your life. I'm, I'm thinking I'd really like that. But so if anybody wants to, uh, you know, take the initiative, hey, that TRI guy here, he says he wants to teach you how to trade and take that 3,000 and really fucking kick ass with it. I think that's a, that's a fair idea. So if anybody wants to take the initiative and reach out to uh, that, that little boy, uh, that was mentioned on the site uh, after that uh, news sort of hit. And uh, frankly speaking, I think that's an excellent idea. So anyway, food for thought. I uh, totally, and like I said, we'll tell the guy, uh, the kid, the man, whatever, uh, put your money away. It's on us. But what I want to see at the end of this 12-week education is I want to see those 100 paper trades, right? And show me you got your journal, you got your logs, you got your trading plan, you're getting in touch with your emotions, you understand what good setups look like, you got your 100 paper trades, so you're over the sort of, ooh, bugaboo about trading, right? You're ready to rock and roll. And that kid could take that three grand, sky's the limit. Okay, uh, so Alessandro, I hope that sort of helps you. I hope I answered that question. And really, the way I would be acting is when my assets, just like we did on Doge, just like we did on all the crazy crypto stocks, as prices are pumping up and, you know, short slailers are getting screwed, whatever, we just keep getting paid. Bang out double, bang out double, just keep getting paid, keep getting paid, keep getting paid. And for God's sakes, don't chase. Ugh. All right, next question. Brian. Did Mr. Roth of the Nortel example give his reasons for doing what he did? Yeah, because he was like, at the time, Nortel Networks itself, the stock represented 35% of the entire Canadian stock market. One company? The entire Canadian stock market? How many stocks are there in the market? I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 stocks? One company. 35% of the entire market. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just ridiculous. We usually say that when one sector represents more than 35% of the equity pie, that's a bubble. And it's a trap. And, of course, at that point, if you look down at the sector uh, modeling down in the States, uh, you know, dot-com, tech, telecom, and really it was more about telecoms back then. Um, it represented about 30-40% of the entire stock market, so that was the warning sign that, oh, well, you know, this, this is just about done. But Nortel, Nortel Networks, right, Canada's tech stock, one stock, 35% of the entire market. <laughs> so that should have been warning unto itself. Uh, to explain why he did what he did, well, you know, the worst part about it is the company didn't actually earn any money. It never had any earnings. Can you believe that? Didn't we say today in class that stocks are earnings engines? Yes. So how does a stock that has no earnings whatsoever can represent 35% of the entire stock market. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Welcome to bubbles. <laughs> bubbles usually don't make sense. And, you know, sadly, I hate to say it, I think we are right in the middle of one big-ass fucking fear bubble right now. And when sort of calmer heads prevail... We're going to find that commodity prices trade back at the cost of production. So whatever commodity asset you're interested in, 
try and figure out what the cost of production is. That's where you want to try and invest. Um, and we probably, you know, like right now, the S&P 500, its P-E ratio is about 35, 36, 37 times earnings. Its historical mean is 15 times earnings. We say that during recession, stock markets usually lose 50% of their value. So if we have a big recession here, stock market comes off 50%, that will bring the PEs back down to the mean or what is normal. So my hunch is through these bubbles, you know, fucking Shane going crazy with his Jupiter Saturn and stuff. You know, people aren't acting logically right now. They're not acting reasonably. We are in a crisis. So for you to actually try and make sense of what's happening right now is actually, ironically enough, it's acting, act, asking too much. Really what you have to do is you got to let the dust settle through all of this. Let the weekly W start to form again, and then we can start thinking about what the future is going to look like. All right. Um, so uh, who else is Dave? Dave, are you here? Did that help answer that question at all? Uh, maybe they would have made a better decision. I mean, I understand he had no duty to disclose why, but did anybody ask him? Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. Um, hey, you're in the level one course, uh, so you know the conversation about how they changed the actual fundamental metrics that they use to value these companies. So under normal circumstances, we use things like price to book, price to sales, price to cash, price to earnings. Well, what do you do if a company doesn't have any earnings? Oh, oh uh, uh, we're going to uh, use EBITDA to justify these stock prices. Well, okay. If you know what EBITDA means, then you understand that if interest rates change dramatically, that whole model could be thrown right out the window. And that's exactly what happened. And, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think interest rates will be the reason why this cycle comes to an end, too. So, go figure. Uh, and is that why Michael Saylor of MicroStrategies had to make his announcement of his purchase of BTC? Um, well, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't know the backstory here of this MicroStrategies. Um, uh, I, I have no idea what's going on there. Because of a requirement for them to make it public when he acts in the market because he is a significant shareholder of his company. Well, if he was buying his own company, and of course he was better than a 33% shareholder, uh, then of course he ha he's required to report. Um, I suppose on balance it's a good sign if you see insiders buying. But I get the funny feeling there was something like this was micro strategies buying Bitcoin. It wasn't Michael Saylor like buying micro strategy stock. So I think what's happened here is that micro strategies considers it a fund and it had a whole bunch of people all pile into the fund saying, hey, we want that crypto exposure. That's why we're here. And a whole bunch of money piled up in his treasury. And people said, why is the money sitting in the treasury and not in Bitcoins? We're here to be long Bitcoins. So he doesn't really have any choice. Money comes in, he has to put it into Bitcoins because that's the mandate of his fund. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this story develops. Also, too... Understand that, you know, like on the gold run up into, um, yeah, well, and if that's the case, uh, Slim Bitcoin says Sailor bought, then pumped his bags with company funds. You know, if that's the case, then, and keep in mind, isn't that an OTC stock anyway? Micro strategies? I don't think it's big board listed, is it? I mean, if you're going to buy an OTC, like these grayscale things, they're all OTC. You know, they could be a total scam. Whoa, what did he just say? <laughs> I mean, why is Grayscale not listed on the big board? What the fuck's up with that nonsense? Oh, because well, then they'd have to report. Well, we don't want to have to report. <laughs> so be careful with all of this shit. 
But the point that I was going to make is, you know, like 1980. Public comes in, they want to buy gold. So they go in and they buy like gold hedge funds. So they want the gold exposure. So does the gold hedge fund say, well, we don't really think this is a good time to invest in gold. No, they, they've got to go buy the goddamn gold. So it's the same thing. So the point here is this is more about like quantitative analysis rather than quote unquote fundamental analysis. Quantitative being things like Google trends, money flows, demographics, all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, you know, uh, why were the funds, why was the Canadian TSE index buying Nortel when it was 35% of the Canadian stock market? That's stupid investing. Well, they had to buy because they have an index mandate. They have to own whatever's in the index. So that's more of what I think's going on here. It's not really like, hey, Bitcoin's a good investment at 30 grand. It's, holy fuck, look at the avalanche of capital that's coming our way. We're not allowed to be invested in cash. Our fund is to be invested in Bitcoin. So get in there and buy them fucking Bitcoins. <laughs> this is the way the game capitalism works. Does that mean it's a good buy? Eh. I mean, who is this Dave Saylor or Michael Saylor guy? Is he your financial advisor? Does he have any fiduciary responsibility, number one, to tell you the truth? By the way, OTC listed, no, he has no legal obligation to tell you the truth. And number two, like uh, this uh, Slim Bitcoin uh, guy saying, is this guy front running your trades? I don't know. Well, MicroStrategy, not OTC. All right, well, that's good. So at least they have a bit of integrity. Um, so, you know, for me to comment on what this gentleman's strategy is, MicroStrategy, I, it'd be impossible for me to say. Well, I don't know. Maybe uh, we should, on a daily brief, we should pick up the phone and call him. What the fuck are you doing over there? <laughs> See what he has to say. <laughs> uh, all right, moving on. Brian, in the second lecture on Fundamentally Thinking video, you intimated that BCT being a buy at $1,000 by Goldman Sachs was outlandish. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that was how many years ago, right? That was back in 2013, 2012. So at that time, yeah. Do you think differently now? Well, the good part about Bitcoin is it it's like, you know, that's the irony of Bitcoin. This is a guaranteed investment. The only problem is, is that Satoshi knew that the uh, powers that be were diluting the purchasing power of the currency at just about the exact same rate. Why, do you think it's an accident that he built in this happening concept? So it's a guaranteed rise market within an environment of a guaranteed fall in value uh, fiat currency environment. Or what should happen is this is a zero sum game. So ironically enough, you figure out what the cost of production is for Bitcoin, that's pretty much where I'm going to tell you where value is. And the irony of it all, today the cost to produce a Bitcoin is somewhere between about 5 and 10 Gs with pretty good equipment. So by definition, it's much, much higher than this level. And Goldman Sachs was right to say it was a buy at $1,000. But remember the fine print of every Goldman Sachs recommendation. What's the duration of that recommendation? If any, you know, all of you on YouTube should know this answer. And actually, am I still connected? Because you guys here, uh, I, I haven't seen anybody say anything here in lunch. That'd be funny if the half hour or so I was just blabbing to myself. Oh, you guys are quiet. Hey, there you are. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, well, yeah, I guess you're back. Uh, fuck him, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Quinn. Quinn's the only person paying attention here today. Good to see you, Quinn. Quinn, you'll kick ass. Um, so, uh, if you bought the Bitcoin at a thousand bucks when they uh, recommended it, within six months, the asset fell by like 
what, 80%? <laughs> Dope! But within three to five years, they even knew the halvening, the built-in price rise. They even knew that, hey, this is a no-brainer. Uh, so I hope that helps explain that. Uh, maybe that was an example of following the smart money. Um, well, you know, the problem there, I mean, you have to take this into context, right? Uh, if you look at the price of Bitcoin when that recommendation was made, eh, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. But that was back here. And I, I remember when this happened, right? They came out right here at 1100 bucks. So, you know, you're going to go buy that and just do nothing and watch it head down about 70, 80, 90% loss. Um, also, too, what I kind of noticed, something really bothering me, uh, sites like TradingView are coming out with like a play-by-play, event-by-event happen, and I pulled up and they've got the reference dates wrong. Uh, somebody should hold them to account for that. But anyway, so Goldman came in up here and said, bye, at $1,100. They were right. It's just you had to wait. That was three to five years, right? So there is three years. You just got your money back. So three to five years into 19. Interesting, even 19, right? Technically, three to five years, they were still right, right? 3x from three to five years. So, on balance, I think they're right. Um, do you wanna go and buy when they say buy at $1,100 and sit there and do nothing? No, uh, that's up to you. Uh, okay, do you think maybe that was an example for this matter or how the microseller or Microsoft is spending all his company's cash in reserves? Well, I mean, we seem to be giving this Michael Saylor guy a hell of a lot of credit I mean, no offense, I've been in the business 30 years. I've never even heard of this guy before, so I'm not quite sure why we're giving him so much credence. Um, I think that, again, what I said there earlier about micro strategies, I don't think they really have any choice. They have to be invested, so a shitload of money comes in. they got to invest it. Is it a good investment? Well, that's another conversation for another day. Uh, and it might be along those lines where, yeah, he's coming piling in here at 40K or 30K or whatever. In five to 10 years, cost of production, will that be justified? Probably. But in the short term, could we see it come back down to 510K and he looks like a fool? Probably. <laughs> I can see both scenarios. Totally. Um... I don't know whether I would consider this the smart money. I mean, did we actually find out? I don't know whether, was he investing his own money in Bitcoin? If he was, and it was to the tune of some serious dollars, well, then maybe I might consider it. I don't know who this person is. I'd be curious to see where he's actually long the micro strategy stock. That would probably be the most important thing for me. Okay, there are other major names doing similar things with their cash reverse. Would these be an example of insider trading? I don't know. Um, what I would prefer to hear is, you know, remember we had Novogratz came in last uh, winter and said that he bought 10,000 of his Galaxy at 98 cents. I have not heard of any insiders coming in and saying they're going to buy Galaxy at like $10 a share. I just I haven't heard anything about that. So I don't know whether actually there is even any insider buying going on here. <clears throat> okay, Brian, uh, in the second lecture on fundamentally thinking that you intimated that BTC... Oh, wait a minute. I already did that one, eh? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Next question. Brian, can you give us your thoughts on keeping an emergency fund in BTC in a cold storage wallet or physical gold and silver? What would you recommend and why? Um, actually, when I used to go to boarding school, uh, all the Arabs, they would send their kids back to our school. And they all had these necklaces with these gold sort of plates. I don't know if you've ever seen them. 
And as the kid would get older and older, they would just increase the carat weighting of the plates and just he would cash in like, you know, 10 carat for 12 carat, 12 carat for 14 carat. For, you know, so go and get a necklace for your wife. I think that's a perfect way to uh, to lock away. In fact, our Bitcoin that we have on Voltero, I've told Seward repeatedly, I would like to get that gold delivered to him. We'll put it in a necklace and his wife will wear it around. No, don't want to do it. I don't know why. I mean, I'm not really a gold chains kind of guy. If I was a gold chains kind of guy, that's probably the route I would go. Uh, maybe gold fillings. I don't know. Um, cold storage wallets, sure. You know, what's the, uh, Shane, what's that thing called? The cherry pie? Apple pie? Blueberry pie. No, what is it? Humble pie. <laughs> raspberry pie, right? That's what it is, right? Alex says Sturk, he likes those raspberry pie things. I don't know. I suppose that's one thing you could do. Uh, those uh, tezzers, aren't they really popular now? So there's that. Celsius at 6 degrees, or 6%. No idea what that means. Raspberry pie. Thank you, Anonymous. Yeah, so... Um, Brian, please tips on how to write on trend lines. <laughs> I love this tool, man. Oh, David O found this. It's so cool. Oh goodness. So, um, and I, 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 you're not gonna write on the trend line. What I would do is, there's your trend line. So uh, if I did that like yellow, now what I would do is I would take the ray and then I'll go like this and then I'll write on the ray text who are you uh, oops super mirror yeah so that's the way I like to uh, to do that isn't that cool? Does that help? Super mirror? Mirror? What do you think? Sebia? Yeah? Talk to me. Give me some loving. Come on, baby. Come on, Super. You can do it. Woo, there's a big move. It's like uh, Kevin's is kicking ass. I think a pump group got this one. Oh boy, are we back into the pump group uh, environment again? What's the name here? <clears throat> well, you can see where Brian would be. Oh, pink! Oh no, that's not pink. P N T. I don't know who that is. Jesus Christ, look at those moves. Yeah, well, we're probably back in that kind of environment, Kevin. Make sure to have those damn open orders working. You know, you saw what I did on that Doge there uh, recently. If you don't have those open orders working, man, these markets will just leave you behind. And I feel kind of badly, right? Because honestly, uh, is Mr. Monks going to reach out to the people that obviously, you know, he told his community to buy. So they all fucking went circle jerk crazy to the upside. But do you think he's going to uh, he's going to get in contact with any of his minions who bought up top here? Uh, and give them, you know, some some love. Actually, it's kind of interesting. He's uh, rallied about 40 or 50 ticks uh, just even since this morning. Uh, but, you know, that's probably the same thing as you're saying there, Kevin. Kevin's posting one in the lounge. I mean, you just got to have your orders working. You can see where my next sell level is. So whoever was asking about the game, right, same sort of thing. You know, I'm not going to get involved in the pump here. I'm certainly not going to get involved here. I'll spoon feed as they work this thing higher. I don't even really want to try and hunt setups here on lower time frames because this probably looks exactly the way I showed you that game. Looks like it probably doesn't set up very well here at all. But let's see. Just for hypothetical sake. Eh, I mean, it's not bad. You can see there was an M breakdown. W, nice inverted head and shoulders. There's your trade right in there. You can see if you wanted to try and get back in. You can see the W down, up, down. Oh, uh, by the way, Grim said that he uh, bought that website. So if anybody wants to uh, uh, visit that website, now Grim owns it. 
So there's your probably trade if you wanted to try and sneak in there. Ah, it might be a bot setting up, but yeah, it's probably nothing I would want to be interested in. Uh, of course, I think yeah, what's interesting about Doge is it's got this huge gap right up here. So that should be filled in at some point. And, you know, considering the season, uh, I'd like to see us get beyond CME uh, and just sort of see what develops following that. But considering the COVID, considering, you know, what I said about the Fed, I don't think the Fed's going to shit on the party here this year. That means the cost of borrowing is probably okay. I wouldn't be surprised if we have like a summer orgy in alts again. Again, I want to see what the market looks like on the other side of that CME event. If risk just falls completely apart here, uh, we might have to wait a month or two before any sort of alt season bottom gets going in earnings. But I am seeing a lot of this kind of chatter. I'm seeing a lot of that. Kevin just posted one so uh, in the uh, in the lounge. So there's a lot of this going on right now. In fact, actually, there was one that I picked up here recently. Uh, good old jo Actually, here, like the pieces of crap are starting to pop here on these various exchanges. Actually, I put out a funny tweet the other day, and actually nobody could figure out what the, uh, what the actual coin was. Um... But I put out a tweet sort of to this effect. And I mean, we'll just use this one. They're, they all look like this. What the hell was it? I think it was uh, Romano's coin. Was it? Anybody remember what the hell the uh, that coin was that I... Because uh, I remember... Uh, oh, it was VAL? I think that's his coin. Isn't this his? I think it's his. I put out a message the other day. Uh, and nobody could figure out what this was. I blacked all this out, and I just said, you know, hopefully you play this game long enough. You see that really your job as an investor is to try and buy low and sell high. So if that's the case, um, isn't this kind of low right now? <laughs> it looks pretty low to me. Is is this the example of, of it being high up here? I, I kind of think so. So I look at names like this and I go, you know, you just saw what happened with that doge. Could that happen with a name like this? Well, why not? <laughs> I find it quite amusing. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Who knows? I mean, I wouldn't put a stopwatch on this. It will happen when it happens. Uh, there's another one that I really like. Same sort of image. I mean, you can just get rid of this stuff, get rid of the price. It doesn't matter. Just look at this. And what's so funny, right, is they uh, hijacked another old name, and then uh, they brought it down, and they cleaned it all up. Actually, I think they even ratcheted it up. And then they brought it out. So I do find it fascinating that they actually had to bring this thing even all the way back down to the original coin. I think it was called the Jumbox, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But in essence, uh, they started the shill, they shilled it, they've washed it out. It looks to me like all the risk is gone. Uh, you can come in here, little old lady, throw it on the pile. I mean, this is ridiculous, the amount of doubles and triples and quadruples and quintuples and gazunkles. I mean, look at these percentage moves. Let, let's just go back to, say, this high here. We're not going to shoot for new highs, just into here. What is that? Oh, that's only 5,873% return. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, I've been playing this game so long. This is so easy. This is... I, I will tell you all, full disclosure, I've been buying, and I will probably buy some more. And my hunch is when it's up into this area, I'll be more than happy to let them have some. And I did the exact same thing on Doge. No difference. Uh, Doge. In fact, actually, I came in a little bit early on Doge. Um, and for some reason, actually, not for some reason, I hit sort of my risk tolerance window. So when I hit my risk tolerance window, I'm not allowed to buy anymore. And so I didn't. But in essence, you know, this is a great one where, yeah, we used to have a funny little saying. Um, 
Anytime Doge is below 30, 40 cents, this is an easy no brain buy. Uh, and anytime it's above a dollar, well, you better be fucking paying yourself. There's that gap up at 270. So this is the same conversation. It's the only problem is, you know, and, you know, in this particular case, you've got a celebrity who's uh, kind of touting the idea. But, you know, would you have had the balls to be looking at something like that there? Because that's when you have to be looking at this. Not after the fact. That's why I show you things like that Ubik, like that Val. I mean, there's a ton of these names that all look like this now. But don't come in after the fact. That's the one thing that just drives you crazy. Is people come in now and say, well, should I be buying? No. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, uh, how are we doing on that question panel? Uh, for whatever it's worth, the local health authorities told me that unfortunately I cannot visit Liam today, so I get a bit more extra time with you here today. That's why I've been going over. So, um, emergency fund in Bitcoin in a cold storage wallet, nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, gold and silver in the form of jewelry, nothing wrong with that at all. Um, the general consensus is to keep it in a bank account. It being what the gold and the silver. Eh. I mean, it, I mean, if you got like twenty pounds of it, it's awfully tough to sort of keep it around. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you have to worry about thieves coming and stealing your possessions. So you're gonna have to personally weigh off the 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 pros and cons about that. Um, it's just with the currency devaluing going on, it doesn't seem like the best idea. You know, I would be very careful here. This is what really concerns me right now. And this is exactly the same as this Nortel conversation. Does it make sense that the university professors were making fun of Mr. Nortel selling his stock because they were thinking backwards? What was the period from 1990 to 2000? What did that look like? It was a huge growth time, huge expansion, the interneting. But is that backwards looking when Nortel price was bid up to the moon? And in 2000, would it have been wise to maybe think, you know, maybe growth has got to take a pause here? The university professors couldn't see that. Mr. Nortel could. Well, I get the feeling that we're in exactly the exact situation just going the other way. The university professors, all they're talking about is currency dilution. All they're talking about is uh, the structural problems in our economy. But is that yesterday's story? Or is that tomorrow's story? I actually think that's yesterday's story. So, you, I, you... You know what this is? This also reminds me of uh, our sassy videos. And are you in the box? Are you part of the box? Maybe you're so intertwined in the box, you, you don't even realize that you are in the box. You are the box. You are part of the box. Anybody who's coming to me and saying they're considering buying Bitcoin at $35,000, they are in the box. They are, they are not thinking clearly. Okay, that's fine. I don't care. It's your money, not mine. Um, so maybe do yourself a favor and step outside the box and ask yourself fear, greed. Everybody in the public is saying that currencies are going to be devalued. Everybody in the public is saying that gold's going to the moon. Everybody says... The public, Bitcoin's going to the moon. Is that trade getting a little maybe one-sided? Right? You know, when people talk publicly, Bitcoin's going to go to the moon. Does that mean that they own Bitcoin, they're short Bitcoin, or they don't even give a shit about Bitcoin? That's a really important question to ask yourself. Same thing with the gold and the silver. If somebody says publicly, oh, Bitcoin area, gold's going up, silver's going up. 
Does that mean that they are long gold and silver, short gold and silver, or they're not even in the market and they couldn't even give a shit? And that's super what I think is going on here. Everybody in the public, long Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Everybody buy gold, long gold, long silver, long commodities. Buy them. I think they're going higher. Currencies are going to be devalued. I'm hearing that these people are invested, that they have a vested interest in their ideas and their theories working. And I think that this trade is way crowded, too crowded. All right, well, there's the rant. Sure hope that helps. Doesn't seem like the best idea. Okay, well. Uh, I guess I'm working on my trading plan and discovering who I am as a trader, and I'm in my early 40s, and I don't have a lot of capital saved right now, so the thought of losing value on what time I do have doesn't sit well with me. Although I'm thinking that when I do start trading, I will be focusing mostly on aggressive growth because I have a pretty regular stable income and i am looking to make up for lost time does that make sense as a strategy um yeah uh, remember what we want to do here at tri is focus on the process so what i'm hearing is uh i'm running behind i uh um i'm a bit desperate um i have to play catch up um are you focusing on the process right now Ironically enough, if you focus on the process, what ends up happening is you focus on making really good investments, and you might find that one investment makes you $10 million. Then what are you going to do? That one fucking investment just threw your whole thesis right out the window. Remember, you know, you're saying you have to play catch up, but you're in your mid 40s. In two and a half years, I was able to take $500 and, I don't know, Shane, Shane loves to rant this number. What was the peak of the value of that silly portfolio at the top of the market there? In two and a half years. Now, remember, I wasn't really motivated. I couldn't give a shit whether I made money or lost money. The point was just to demonstrate the process. Shane, you with me? I always like to... Uh, I don't know. This chat thing's not really working for me. I don't know whether you guys are here or not. Hey, there you are. Uh, yeah, he's going to tell us how much it was in Doge. <laughs> oh, well, he's gone. I don't know. I think I took that portfolio up to about 600 Gs or something like that. So, I mean, seriously, $500 into $500,000 in two years? Are you not maybe uh, focusing on the wrong thing here? You can make all the money you ever need. Remember my little message to the little, the little boy, right? You can make all the money you ever need if you just simply let go and follow the process. You're concentrating on the wrong thing here. And by the way, I mean, you're here in the school. So just, dude, just let go and just learn the process. The money will take care of itself. We, what you need, unfortunately, is you need a friendly market state. I can guarantee you, all of our TRI SOFers, we sat there for about a year or so just twiddling our thumbs. We didn't do a hell of a lot. Then all of a sudden, the market turned friendly, and now these guys are making more money than they know what to do with. But the key was, Follow the process, set yourself up for success, and then when the market state of, uh, presents itself that's friendly to your particular approach or strategy, then you just fucking own the market and you make gazillions of dollars. They're just spilling out of 20 different directions. But it's the process. That's what you have to concentrate on. Okay, hopefully that answered that. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, Dave, uh, and, you know, if, if this is you, Dave Wenger, uh, you know, um, I'm seeing a lot of effort on your part. 
my feeling is just get through this 12 weeks. We will have our way with you. <laughs> then your job is to just sit and follow the process. And if you do that for a few years, you'd be surprised at what will happen. But you have to be patient, you have to be disciplined, and you have to follow the process. Okay, could you explain Uranus cycles? In the lounge, you have made some references, but I don't understand the links. Um, Uranus cycles, yeah. You know, ironically enough, we should probably set up uh, if, uh, I think, you know, maybe, I don't know whether Shane's here or not. I think he bailed. But uh, I think maybe we should even do like a daily brief. Cole, uh, Shane, and any of the other astro uh, um, enthusiasts on the site, I wouldn't mind maybe just doing like a, a daily brief presentation. I mean, in essence, um, each of the planets in our solar system has a fairly regular uh, 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 orbit that uh, um, we find that as the really the best way I think to describe it is that kind of like the seasons in the year winter is winter it snows in winter it's icy and what are the what are all the sort of side effects well don't bury your money in the ground because you won't be able to get to it why because you know the ground freezes in winter not gonna be able to grow too much food in winter why because it's pretty fucking cold plants can't grow well you get the idea right there's certain characteristics about that season that are universal same thing with spring same thing with summer same thing with fall and each part of the year is very unique and you cannot break it it's just the way that it is so i get the impression that there are bigger cycles cycles of things like money and, <clears throat> and interest rates cycles of things like sunspots cycles that which obviously uh, greatly affect agriculture uh, things, there's probably like volcano cycles. Uh, you know, uh, the Dark Ages, they actually attribute to a volcano that blew up in uh, the Indian Ocean, or uh, uh, Indonesia area. So, think of the planets orbiting around, very predictable. Just think of them more like this big-ass fucking clock that's just spinning around above our heads. And it turns out that when different planets happen to be in different parts of the zodiac or whatever you want to call it, the sky, then we humans have to go through certain behavioral traits, behavioral patterns. Um, I also think, too, that when the planets themselves intermingle and create angular relationships with each other, that those are the kind of forces on our little species that we just don't have the tools yet to be able to measure. You know, as a market participant, I, I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that uh, when Jupiter and Saturn cross paths, you better be damn careful with your money. <laughs> and I think you all hopefully have learned that. And the good part about it is we don't have to go through another one of these goddamn things for another 20 years. And the good part about it is the next one, it's a euphoric one. So that means we'll all be fucking dancing around naked, uh, having a party and making fun of guys like John uh, Roth for uh, suggesting that growth is not endless. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny how we're in such polar opposites. Like 20 years ago, I would sit down with people and they would literally say, there is no fucking way you are going to get me to buy a gold stock. Exact opposite of what I'm hearing today. I mean, everybody wants to buy their silver here. And 
growth and this thing called the interneting, its growth was endless. It will never end growing. <laughs> so you know, take it for whatever it's worth. Uh, can you learn from this? I don't know. Sure hope so. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, markets and money and all that kind of stuff. Um, I see very, very cyclical patterns. So you want to uh, Google what is the Uranus um, orbit duration? I think it's something like about 85 years or something like that. But in essence, that's what we're making reference to. And, you know, I would say that Uranus in its particular spot right now is very, a lot of the behaviorals that we've seen when Uranus is in this particular spot. Think of the clock in the sky. It's at like 8.57 p.m. Should we be expecting sunrise at 8.57 p.m.? Not really. Uh, or think of Uranus where it is in the sky right now is like, uh, you know, Labor Day weekend. Should we be uh, packing our ski suits and getting ready for a day on the mountains? Uh, enjoying the winter festivities on Labor Day weekend? Not really. So think of it sort of that way. There you go. So Bob Collins says once every 84 years. Okay. Um, can, last question here, Brian. Can you please go over, summarize the WDB, GARP, and CanSlim fundamental screen models again and how to use them to find investment ideas? I'm having a hard time fully understanding how these models work. Uh, well, each model has uh, various criteria. And really all you're doing is you're just going through and just asking if your particular asset meets the criteria of each of the models. Uh, in the school program, the criteria specifically for each model is laid out very clearly. So maybe go and watch the pre-recorded lecture a few times. Uh, there's three mo or four models that I uh, show you guys. So the VCIM, which is the venture cap model you're missing here. But in essence, as I said, in the lectures, each model caters to a different part of the investment spectrum. So WDB is all about price of an asset should be below book value. Price should be trading less than three times cash on the books. Assets should be trading at less than 10 times earnings. That's a value model. All right, we are looking at value stocks. GARP is growth at a reasonable price. It's probably the model that I use least, but it's a way that if I wanted to invest in a mature growth company like Microsoft or Dell or actually Dell, not anymore, eh? um, you know, Apple or Amazon, if I just make sure that I don't pay more than two times PEG, price to earnings growth rate, then I'm buying that growth at a reasonable price. Very straightforward in the lecture. Can slim? It was a model that was created by a gentleman by the name of William O'Neill. And he just simply asked, what are some of the criteria I've found about good winning stocks? Current earnings, quarter over quarter, increase of 25%. Annual earnings increase, at least 25%. New product, new uh, system, something different, relatively low amount of stock own, uh, outstanding, uh, relative market leadership. That's L, this is a tough one. It's, uh, not really publicly disclosed information. There are ways that we measure relative performance to like things like the S&P 500. I can show you that in broiler chicken or uh, in the daily brief if you want. 
Um, I stands for low institutional uh, ownership. And M stands for a friendly market state. So again, all of these are really, they're just nothing more than each model has very specific criteria. And when you go and do your research on your specific stock, in fact, uh, Grimm's got office hours uh, this week. My suggestion to you is pull the slide, if you want, from the lecture. Show me an example of what you think is a stock that's a value stock, WDB stock, right? Less than book, less than three times cash, less than uh, 10 times PE. Show me an example of GARP. Growth stock, trading less than two times PEG. Show me a stock with CanSlim. This is going to be a little bit harder to find. But we do have like the starters of the uh, of the filters just even in the uh, library under fundamental screens. Uh, all right, so you can see WDB. There's CanSlim. So you can see we got uh, small market cap. We've got EPS growth, 25%, 25%. We've got low institutional uh, participation. You can't do a shares outstanding screen on these guys without paying for the Hoot and Falutin uh, membership, so that's why we went with micro. But gives you a nice little shopping list to start. And then, of course, later on in the program, you're going to learn about technical setups. So now we have our list of fundamentally attractive names, and we start hunting for weekly W's and all that kind of stuff. Look at this one, P-I-X-Y. It's like something interesting there. Look at this one, QLGN. That looks interesting. So you can even see this. Oh, PRPO, we already know this one. Remember, we used to trade this one. Uh, Kevin, you probably remember this one. But anyway, you can see a cute little looks like a bot setup firing there. So I can already start to see the setups just eyeballing this stuff. So hopefully that helps. Okay, uh, I've been blabbing away here for a couple hours. Uh, I think I'm going to go uh, lie down for a bit. So I hope you guys all enjoyed that uh, conversation today. Uh, PMA for the win. If anybody knows uh, that little boy or whatever the social network is with a little GameStop win guy, uh, I'm serious. I'll be more than happy to uh, bring him into the TRI community, teach him how to uh, take that 3000 and let's turn it into $3 million. What the hell? So uh, have yourselves a great day, everybody. Sure hope you enjoyed the offering. PMA for the win. All the best. And bye for now.